so my approach with nutrition science has always been to let the science do the talking and be led by the data, be open to changing your mind. Very few topics are more hotly debated than nutrition. It truly is right up there with politics and religion. But the irony is that in terms of the optimal diet that considers both human and planetary health, the hard science is actually quite clear that we should and actually must be moving towards a diet that is as plant exclusive as possible. Nonetheless, misinformation persists confusing and paralyzing the average well-intentioned person, which can and often does lead to avoidable disease. To help us today parse fact from fiction and guide us towards a reasoned, rational model for nutritional health and well-being, we convene with my friend, Simon Hill. Simon is the host of the fantastic Plant Proof podcast and blog of the same name, both absolutely incredible resources. And he applies his master's degree in nutrition to objectively decipher the scientific literature to help people make better diet and lifestyle choices to promote optimal health and longevity. Simon is also the plant-based food contributor to Chris Hemsworth's Fitness App Center. And he's the author of this fantastic new book, The Proof is in the Plants, which is a phenomenal evidence-based primer on the positive impact of a plant-predominant diet. We had all the hot topics today, tribal diet wars, what the science says, what it doesn't, the environmental implications of our food choices, the truth about saturated fat, cholesterol, and seed oils, and the key things you can and should be doing right now to perform at your peak, sidestep disease, promote longevity, and live both optimally and consciously. For so many reasons, Simon is the health and nutrition resource we all need right now. And this one is packed with crucial, perhaps even life-saving information, including links that Simon has provided to all the studies that he references throughout the conversation, which you can find in the show notes on the episode page at richroll.com. So with that being said, please enjoy my conversation with Simon Hill. Mate, how long have we talked about doing this? It's been a long time. It has coming. been a long time. <laughs> Years, in fact. I know. It's... I was in Australia. I was tempted to do it with you then. Mm. I've been on your show a bunch of times. We've been friends for a couple of years at this point. Um, I think I reached out to you to do this earlier, but you kind of wanted to sit on it until your book was coming out. Mm. So we waited. Here we are, you're in Los Angeles. Good to see you, my friend. Thank you. Likewise. Uh, it's bloody awesome to be here. Let me tell you that. It's been a uh, a long time coming. You're right, um, but I think it's I think it's nice timing with the book coming out. Yeah, absolutely, man. And I'm excited to get into the book and everything like that. But just you know, sort of a, a prefatory way of contextualizing this. The thing that I, you know, besides our friendship, the thing that I really appreciate about you the most is your very kind of grounded, rational, non-absolutist approach to nutrition. Everything that you talk about and advocate is objective, it's evidence-based, you're not driven by ideology, you're calm in your delivery, you have experience and education in nutrition, you're non-hyperbolic, and your analysis of nutrition science is always deeply rooted in, in the studies and your advocacy is oriented around actionable, doable um, changes that people can make. And, and you deliver all of this in a non-judgmental and very even keeled approach, which I think is something that we not only need right now, but I think we're thirsting for mm. in, a, in a, a kind of social media landscape, at least that um, tilts towards extremism and um, hyperbolic narratives. Mm. Yeah, well, that, that means a lot to me because you know I think I pride myself on trying to communicate the science as objectively as possible. 
And, you know, I'm a big believer in science and how science can help us better understand the world and better navigate it and, and improve our lives. But you're right. I think a lot of the, the nuanced conversation has been lost and some of that is a result of social media and the algorithms that are at play and the, the absolute message is often, you know, favored from an engagement point of view. Mm-hmm. It will, it will reinforce one's identity and at the same time, perhaps challenge and trigger the other side's identity, which is the ultimate results if you're looking to create engagement and excitement. Um, so, you know, I've, ever since I was a little kid, I have had a deep appreciation for science and being able to use it as a tool to help reduce the amount of uncertainty. And that's mm-hmm. what science is. Yeah, it's It's using a method to test our intuition our hypotheses and to reduce that uncertainty so we can make decisions with more confidence. Mm -hmm. Uh, And so my approach with nutrition science has always been to let the science do the talking and be led by the data, be open to changing your mind. And, you know, a lot of that I've, I've really learned from, from my dad. Mm-hmm. Yeah, your dad was a scientist, a medical doctor. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and you have this kind of evolution story of how you got into nutrition science that that really begins with a health crisis that was faced by your dad. Mm. Yeah, I when I was maybe three or four years old, that's sort of as far back as my memory goes, maybe five. Uh, as early as I can recall, you know, I would be surrounded by scientific papers. My dad would print these things out you know, <laughs> yeah. and they would fill up the coffee table. And you know, if, I, if he picked me up from school, I'd have to lift them up off the car seat just to get into the car. And they'd always be highlighted and I couldn't make much sense of them, but I could see how important science was to my dad and the work that he was doing. He, he got his uh, PhD in Texas so we, we moved as a family to Texas where he did his PhD in physiology and, you know, has gone on since then to, to have 30 or 40 years of, of academic research as a professor and, you know, publica- publishing in, you know, circulation and metabolism, leading journals and a very well-respected professor uh, in, in his field of physiology, which is looking, you know, right under a microscope at the micro level mechanisms, deep science, mm-hmm. you know, much deeper than what I do. I, I tend to zoom out and think about what's, what's the big picture? What does this mean to you and I? How can we make better decisions and be healthier? And how can we consider the world around us? Uh, but, you know, his, his research, you know, equally as important, uh, understanding the mechanisms that are at play has been dedicated to, to looking at how our arteries function and, and dysfunction and uh, what happens when you develop type two diabetes and cardiovascular disease. And um, this is somewhat ironic because you're right, I did experience for the first time what loss of health looks like. And on, on weekends, my dad and my brother, you've met my brother mm-hmm. a couple of years ago here in LA, James. And uh, he's actually the one that introduced me to your show originally. Mm. Uh, on weekends, when we had moved back to Australia, so when I was about 10 years old and my dad had finished his PhD in, and was working as an assistant professor in America, we moved back to Australia. And on weekends, we would go and explore an area called the Yarra Valley. And it, it's, it's a beautiful wine district in Victoria, you know, rolling hills, uh, incredible scenery. And we would go and visit little wineries. My dad always liked to choose the small ones. And, you know, if you, if you went to these more boutique wineries, and this wasn't about 
the the alcohol. It was about the experience, mm -hmm. and you you could speak to the winemaker usually, and you know you could see their passion they had for what they were doing. And so we we would have a lot of fun together exploring these areas. And on this one particular day, and it was just my dad and I, um, we we had a fantastic day out together. And uh, you know, my dad had a, an MGB convertible. I can remember these days vividly. My dad had an MG midget. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I know I know the vibe. You know, great. Yeah great cars and the the roof would come down and we would play you know, classics like U2 and Rolling Stones and Cat Stevens and, you know, all that sort of stuff. And I think, you know, a lot of people listening perhaps can relate to that, perhaps with experiences with, you know, their parents or uncle or someone in their life. Those days you look back on, you know, 20, 30 years ago uh, and with, with very sort of fond memories. These were those days for me. And on this one day in particular, as we're driving home, it's dusk, I could see that my dad was uncomfortable and he was slightly grimacing and he was also rubbing his chest. And I asked him if everything was okay. And he said he was feeling some chest pain, but downplayed it. And we continued to go home and, and cook dinner. And I, I remember checking in again and he said that everything was fine. So we had dinner and thinking nothing of it, I went off to bed. And a uh, short while afterwards, I woke to some noise in the kitchen and I thought, well, thinking about what had happened, I, I better go and check if he's okay. And when I went out, I could see he was making his way to the phone. He had, he had the phone in his hand by that stage and uh, he was on his knees. He, th at this stage, this was Rich, the first time that I've ever seen my dad with so much fear in his eyes. It was a point now that he, he could no longer deny what was happening and he was pale, he was out of breath and it was very obvious that he was struggling. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I actually spoke with the, the uh, lady on the other end of the line, he had called triple zero, which is like calling 911 here. And uh, I, I was explaining what was happening and uh, you know, all of this was happening super quickly. And, you know, I was 15 at the time. My dad was 41. Mm, this was young. out of nowhere. Um, you know, he, he was not reliant on the healthcare system. He had no medical diagnosis. He was not taking any medications. He was uh, living the standard Australian lifestyle. And if you looked at my dad at that stage, you would not look at him and say he is particularly unhealthy. You know, he, he, was in you know decent shape and would exercise and you know for all intents and purposes was just representative of a young Australian dad. Right, and studying vascular physiology right. at the time. Right, so uh, you know many years later and, and, and now a better understanding what happened and, and the disease at play, which I'll go into, uh, you know, it's become clear to me that my dad knew exactly what was happening <laughs> at the time. And I think this denial is quite common, um, particularly in males that are experiencing poor health. Yeah. And perhaps if you, if you deny what you're feeling, it will go away. Right. <laughs> yeah. uh, I'm not sure it works like that. Yeah, I have some familiarity with that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you know, so the, the lady on the other end of the line after me explaining what was happening, said, we need to send a helicopter. And so where we were at that uh, point in time, my dad had a, a place in King Lake. So my parents were separated when we moved back, they got divorced um, when we moved back to Australia. And my mum and, and, and my brother and I, we were actually living in Melbourne. And then I, we would spend weekends with dad. Uh, so 
they said we need to send a helicopter. King Lake is is quite remote. It was like this mud brick house in the middle of nowhere. Mm. My dad's always loved being out in the middle of nowhere. Um, and uh, then anyway, it was a long way from the nearest hospital. So they did, they sent a, a helicopter and it came so quickly and they rushed in and scooped him up, put him onto a stretcher and uh, put put him on oxygen and were checking his vital signs. And uh, before I knew it, he was in the helicopter and it was flying off and I couldn't fit in the helicopter. So they said to me, I could follow in a, in a car, in an ambulance to the hospital. And uh, by that time, I, I called my mother and my brother and said, you probably should come to the hospital. This is what's happening. I, I don't know what the outcome is here. We really don't know uh, the specifics, but dad's not in a good way. And, you know, that car ride to the hospital, it, it felt like it took forever. And uh, we got to the hospital and we waited and waited. And then, um, you know, the doctor came out and, and said to us, we've saved your father's life. He's had a severe heart attack, which of course that was, you know, the fact they saved his life was what we were most concerned about then and there. Um, but we were very shocked that at 41, mm -hmm. this had come out of nowhere. And the next day there was a family meeting, you know, as there often is, it's a bit of a debrief, you know, what's happened, what's the prognosis, et cetera. And so we met with the the cardiologist and he had taken my uh, dad's history and it was quite clear that cardiovascular disease did does run in my family and my grandfather had had a heart attack at about age 61 i believe my grandmother so my my dad's that was my dad's dad my dad's mom my grandmother she had vascular dementia um and so the cardiologist said to my brother and I, my brother was 18, I was 15. Uh, he said that, you know, cardiovascular disease runs in families. Clearly it's running in yours. And this will be something that you need to be screened for as you get older. And looking back on that today, that, that is great advice. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> but the conversation ended there. Mm -hmm. And, you know, yeah, it's, 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 you know, it lacks any sense of agency. This is a predestined thing. This is genetically, you know, motivated and you're going to have to contend with it at some point. But, mm -hmm. and that, that's very much of that time as mm -hmm. well, right? Like we know a lot more now about how we can intervene and make these lifestyle mm -hmm. choices. But, um, you know, I was told the same thing. My grandfather died early. Like I, I know that whole drill and, and what it leaves you with and you tell me how you felt was this, you know, sense that there really isn't much you can do about it. Mm. Yeah, you've been dealt a bad card. Mm -hmm. uh, so, I mean, that is how I felt and my brother felt for many years was that, you know, what's to say we're not going to follow in my dad's footsteps. You know, he was, he was living a typical Australian lifestyle. He wasn't from the outside unhealthy and this has happened to him. So how, why will it be any different for us? Right. You know, if you do the same thing as everyone around you, how can you expect different results? Right. Uh, so it's disempowering when, when you yeah. get that news and you, you put your health down to purely to genetics. Yeah. Uh, and you know, it was, it was many years later that I would come to learn that, you know, while genetics do create predispositions and can increase your likelihood of developing a certain disease, your lifestyle and the way that you're, you're navigating your life has a lot more say. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there are a bunch of, of studies looking at identical twins, for example, exact same genes, different environments growing up, nature versus nurture, what happens? Mm -hmm. And these studies have been able to tease out what is the impact of genetics versus lifestyle. And broadly speaking, and of course this can, this is different depending on the type of, of genes that someone has, but broadly speaking, if we're thinking about 
you know, these big chronic diseases like cardiovascular disease, type 2 diabetes, fatty liver disease, uh, even Alzheimer's, dementia. Broadly speaking, your genes are, are, are controlling about 20% of your health fate. And that means that your, your environment and your lifestyle is controlling 80%. You know, it's four times more powerful. And so, uh, of course, when you come across that information, then, you know, the game changes, the narrative mm -hmm. flips mm -hmm. from being disempowered to being incredibly empowered. Yeah. So it was your brother, correct me if I'm wrong, who was the first instigator in terms of getting you interested in nutrition. Mm -hmm. You've done your research. <laughs> a little bit. Well, I know you too, so it's not like. Yeah. Uh, uh, I, I didn't expect any less. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, you know, finishing, uh, when I finished high school, I, I actually wanted to become a doctor. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I got really, really strong grades at school, but not quite strong enough to get into medicine in Melbourne. Mm. And so I was accepted to do medicine, but in Tasmania mm. and I, I wasn't quite prepared to, to, to make the, the move down to Tasmania and give up my friendships and give up playing football. And, uh, so I made the decision to stick around and, uh, I did physiotherapy instead in Melbourne. And, uh, the reason I, I, uh, I tell you this is because I was very much indoctrinated and I was surrounded by this fitness culture. I was working in football club environments mm -hmm. and this is, these are environments where animal protein is king. Yeah. And so uh, there was a, a Christmas where my brother was coming up to stay with me and with his fiance at the time, Lauren, who's now his wife. And he called me up and he said, you know, we've, we've been reading and listening uh, to a few things, probably your podcast and, uh, and probably some of Dan Butner's work, I believe. And, uh, you know, he, he had come across some information to suggest that there were, there were populations that were not experiencing the same levels, the same degree of cardiovascular disease that our societies experience. And of course, thinking back to our, our dad's history and grand, grandfather's history, that was meaningful information for my brother to come across and enough for, for him to want to explore. And he's, uh, you know, from a, a business background. So it was, it was not something that was inspiring him to get deep into the science or the weeds with. Uh, he just, he felt that the information was uh, of high enough quality to act on. Mm -hmm. And he called me to say, uh, Lauren and I have, have changed the way we're eating a bit and it was a, a bit of a heads up. You know, they were coming to stay with me and, and I was going to do some grocery shopping, of right. course, and, and take them out for dinner. Uh, <laughs> and, and he said, we're, we're no longer eating red meat and chicken. Mm -hmm. we've, we've adopted a pescatarian diet. I think this might've been like my introduction to dietary labels. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Before then, I hadn't given a whole lot of thought to all the different dietary labels that exist or the dietary wars. I was just, you know, doing what, what I knew. Uh, and, you know, I said to him, well, that's, that's cool. Uh, you know, I eat fish and we can make that work. And uh, I'm sure we can find restaurants that will cater for that. And, about, that was a few months before him coming up. And then about a week before he came up, he called me up again and he said, yeah, we've, uh, we've changed our diet a little more. <laughs> <laughs> the volume's getting turned up. Yeah. And, and I thought, okay, I thought maybe he, he'd reverted. And he said, well, we've, we've decided to remove the fish. <laughs> and I was thinking, <laughs> what the fuck is left? <laughs> You know, how long ago was this? This is 2014, 15. Uh -huh. Yeah. Uh, not that long ago. Yeah. 2014, 15. Uh, and so, uh, I said to him, I said, look, well, I'm definitely going to need some help with regards to knowing what to buy. And, and certainly with restaurants, you know, I had no business in choosing the restaurants mm -hmm. that would be uh, catering for, 
for vegan meals. Mm-hmm. You know, to be honest, I had never really considered a, a diet without animal products. And he came up and both he and Lauren are, uh, are, are, are great cooks and particularly Lauren. And so they did a lot of cooking and we went out to some restaurants and the, the feeling that I was left with at the end of those two weeks was, you know, not any pressure from them. They weren't asking me to consider how I was eating. We just had a great two weeks together and the food was delicious. And so the feeling that I was left with was, well, if my brother's right and there is some information out there that suggests you can change the way you're eating and reduce your risk of cardiovascular disease. And I know that I don't have to sacrifice on, on flavor and joy and, and the experience, then this is something that, I should be looking into. Right, but for those that aren't watching on YouTube and are just listening, what you might not know is that, you know, Simon is a is a physical specimen. <laughs> like you're a buffed, big, strong guy and you're working with Australian rules football guys at the time, like your focus is on performance and um, strength and agility and all of these things, right? So how does that information mesh with everything that you knew up to that point and were interested in because yes, oh, I feel good and this tastes good, but how is this going to fuel me and you know, keep me in the physical condition to mm. which I'm accustomed? So I, I had that fear completely. Uh, I think for the first step for me was, was first looking at the information and, and science around chronic disease and then when I had unearthed information there and it became clear to me that there was a way to eat to reduce your risk of chronic disease, the next step was, am I going to have to sacrifice the physical performance, athletic pursuits? Am I going to be able to maintain improved strength, et cetera? Uh, and so the, you know, the first step, Rich, for me from after that was, you know, I was trained in physiotherapy initially. You gotta remember at this mm-hmm. time, I actually hadn't done my master's in nutrition science. This has been, that, that's been done in the last seven years. Mm-hmm. So when, when, when my brother came and stayed with me and inspired me to think about this, I had no formal training in nutrition. I had done an undergraduate degree in physiotherapy, which is a, a four year sort of bachelor in science. So you cover a lot of physiology and anatomy. And I, I had a, I did an honors year where I wrote my own thesis, performed a review, conducted my own study and wrote it up. So I understood how to look at research and a- analyze it, albeit from a, from a different lens, a different area of mm-hmm. science. So the first step for me was to try and look, get into the literature and see if what my brother was telling me was true or not. <laughs> and I, I, you know, I quite often say, I wanted to prove him wrong. <laughs> I, I was healthy. I wasn't ex- having uh, any health issues. I was strong. I was fit. Everything about my diet seemed to be working for me, not against me. Mm-hmm. And as I was getting into the research, initially what I realized was how many polarizing views there are and how confusing it is and tribal. And one moment I thought I understood something, then I'd see the exact opposite. Right. And that's what inspired me to go and do the master's in nutrition science because I realized even though I had training at an undergraduate level, in science, I was not equipped with the skills to, to make full sense of it and to really decode it. Mm-hmm. And so uh, it was back to university mm-hmm. and to, to really focus in on, on the research-based side of things and, and then get right down into the weeds of the nutrition science uh, to, to try and understand exactly what an optimal diet looks like. Right. So you get your master's in nutrition science. There's a whole 
like sort of backstory or backdrop here, this entrepreneurial journey that, that you've been on, mm. that's almost its own podcast. We can maybe revisit that in a little bit, but you emerge from that experience. You become steeped in the science. You have this um, kind of urgent call to advocacy that leads you to create um, plantproof.com and the plantproof podcast and, and you know the latest iteration now being this new book, The Proof is in the Plants. Um, but walk me through how you arrived at a certain kind of global thesis around mm -hmm. nutrition and perhaps state that case. Mm -hmm. So I guess the thesis to, to start here with the thesis, and then I can go into how I came to that and how I look at science in general. The thesis is that there is, there is a set of characteristics or a theme that define a uh, an optimal diet. And rather than one particular dietary brand being absolutely proven by science as the most optimal. And this theme is that, you know, diets that are low in saturated fat, that provide good amounts of unsaturated fat, that are rich in fiber, that have a good amount of plant protein and are low in ultra processed foods, time and time again, lead to good health outcomes. Mm -hmm. You know, these are the people that are experiencing less cardiovascular disease, less, less likelihood of having a heart attack or a stroke, less risk of developing type two diabetes, less risk of fatty liver disease, less risk of various cancers and less risk of neurodegenerative diseases. Uh, and the cool thing, I guess, about that theme is that there are many variations of that. You know, that could be a really thoughtfully constructed Mediterranean diet, Mediterranean diet as described by Ansel Keys, who, who was a very prominent scientist in the mid 1900s. He described that as a largely vegetarian diet. You know, it does include some animal products, but they're not as emphasized as a standard Western diet today. It could be a really well done pescatarian diet. It could be a really done, well done vegetarian diet. It could be a completely plant exclusive, whole food, plant-based diet. And so uh, it means that there are lots of ways to, to sort of eat your way to good health. Mm -hmm. uh, and that, you know, that's a, that's a sort of less absolute message and perhaps not as sexy. Yeah, that's, that's, that makes it difficult. You can't come up with a label for this or some kind of contrite, specific, drilled down term that allows it to trend on Twitter mm. and um, you know create a, a simplified idea that can get lodged in someone's brain. But that's that, science. That's science, and and you know the way I like to kind of describe this to people is that you know any of those diets, if you compare them to a standard diet, and there are a bunch of studies that have done those, you'll see you'll see significant risk reductions for various diseases. But if you were to run, let's say a randomized controlled trial from birth and, and, and just include those dietary patterns that I just mentioned, which are all, all sort of very thoughtfully constructed diets, and you were to follow those people across their lifespan, you're unlikely to see any difference in outcomes because all of those diets are, are so vastly, so significantly different to the standard Western diet, which is the diet that is provoking disease the most. Uh, and you know, so how, how do I look at science and sort of come to that conclusion? Uh, you know, a few, a few different principles kind of guide the work, I guess, that I do uh, and when you understand these principles, it also makes social media and, and the headlines a little frustrating. <laughs> uh, uh -huh. But I guess if, firstly, not all science is equal. Right, so we could talk about the hierarchy of science. We hear terms like randomized controlled trials, population studies, epidemiological studies, all of that. And you know, perhaps we have some familiarity with what those mean, but walk us through that hierarchy mm -hmm. and how we parse fact from fiction when it comes to evaluating the multitude of studies that are out there, among which you can always find 
you can find a study or cherry pick this or that that's going to affirm your thesis. Mm -hmm. So yeah, the evidence hierarchy allows us to to kind of add weight to certain evidence based on how reliable and valid it is. And at the the very bottom, which is the sort of least reliable and least valid evidence is expert opinion. You know, that's if I just say something without a citation, you know, uh, someone, a professor or a doctor just says something that's considered very weak evidence. Just above that is laboratory studies. These are, you know, in vitro studies, looking at cells under a microscope or animal studies. And, you know, it, this, it's not to say that this science is not important. It can be an important part of piecing together the puzzle, mm -hmm. but it's, it's hypothesis generating. Right, the idea that a certain metabolic pathway in a mouse that you could extrapolate to mm -hmm. how that applies to human health is tenuous at best. Yeah, and we see, you know, time and time again, you know, lectins or soy and a lot of a lot of people generating fear about these and they are they are arriving at that conclusion based on this sort of in vitro animal based study and overlooking the human health outcome data, which which really is a more valid uh, source of information for public health recommendations. Mm -hmm. It's interesting to see what happens in a cell or in an animal, but we also then have to zoom out and see what, what happens in a human. And, right. and also you can fall into some, some traps with, with research in, in an animal or, or in vitro where the, the exposure level is very important. You can, for example, you could, if you're looking at uh, phytoestrogens uh, in soy, for example, uh, you could look in an animal model and show estrogenic effects. And, and then perhaps that could get you worried about the development of hormone dependent cancers like prostate and breast cancer. Um, but what a lot of those, what a lot of those studies uh, have looked at, if you were to look at the exposure level on a per kilograms of, of those phytoestrogens per kilogram of body mass or pound of body mass, what you would see is that the, the exposure level in that, that rat is magnitudes higher than the exposure level that any human would ever be exposed to mm -hmm. through eating toy, uh, soy or tempeh, et cetera. Um, so not only is physiology different at the animal level between an animal and a human, but also sometimes exposure can be right. significantly different. Um, so that's, uh, I guess, the, the, the sort of level above uh, expert opinion. Uh, and, you know, I think something else that is probably useful here is, uh, you know, Fleming discovered penicillin. And I think that was back in 1936 or something. Yeah, mid-30s. Yeah, and... And he, he discovered that through, uh, started in a Petri dish that he'd left out <laughs> and he saw that this mold was uh, destroying the bacterial cells. And then by studying the mold, he was able to isolate penicillin. And then he was able to use penicillin uh, effectively in rats um, as, as an antibiotic and then was able to do it again in humans. And that kind of progression that, that progression is actually very rare. <laughs> you might have 150, 100,000 discoveries in a rat that don't play out in a human for every one that does. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we hear of these success stories like Fleming and penicillin and we think, well, oh, you know, the animal model is, is a, a great model, yeah. it's sound. Um, but what we don't hear of is how often it fails. Um, so I think it's just an important reminder that it is a hypothesis generating level of science and, you know, really we shouldn't be making public health recommendations from that level of science alone, unless there is zero human outcome data and you want to take a, a sort of precautionary stance. Right. Uh, so then the rung above that is observational 
science, epidemiology, and there are a bunch of different types of observational study designs. But the the key point here is you're looking at humans that live in a population and you're observing the way they live. In the case of nutrition, you're looking at what they eat or don't eat and you're looking at specific health outcomes. And you're trying to see if you can find any sort of tight associations. You know, these people that are eating more of this end up having a higher risk of this. For example, you know, people that are eating more uh, ultra processed meats have around 18% higher risk of colorectal cancer per 50 grams consumed per day. Uh, and it's not a, a perfect science, but no science is. And, sure. and I think often observational science uh, gets slammed uh, by, by certain folks out there. Uh, and, and one of the common sort of uh, criticisms is that there is a healthy user effect. And, and that is that, you know, if you're looking at, at, at populations of people who are eating more fruits and vegetables uh, and, and you're looking at uh, health outcomes, be it cancer or cardiovascular disease, perhaps it's not the fact that they're eating fruits and vegetables, but that that's a sign that they live a healthy life. Sure, there's all these co-founding variables yeah. and the Achilles heel being that when you're in this observational modality, you can't control for any of those variables. Mm -hmm. People are just living their lives. So there's also the risk of rife misreporting as well, because mm -hmm. it's, it's based on people reporting what they're eating mm -hmm. and how they're living on some level, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, are people actually writing down what they're really doing or are they writing down what they think you want to hear? Mm -hmm. There's room for all kinds of error. But at the same time, if you're taking massive populations of people, you can extrapolate from that some general trends and there is some level of reliability with what you're observing. It's just limited in terms of what you can extrapolate from that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you, you, can't, you can't create a, a sort of cause and effect conclusion. You can't say that that variable A is causing this outcome. Um, so you can only speak to associations. Mm -hmm. uh, but even I think something that's really important here is that the researchers are aware of the limitations of this study design, and 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 so the you know the confounding variables, for example, although you might not be able to rem remove their comp complete effect, they do through statistics control for them. So the idea is if you are uh, really well, if you have a really well defined population, that you are as best as possible, working out how often pe people drink alcohol, how often they smoke, how often they exercise. And in your analysis, let's say for example, you wanna look at the fibers effect on a certain health outcome. The idea with, with controlling for confounding variables is that we're not going to compare uh, people that have uh, significantly different uh, consumption of alcohol. What we're going to do is compare high and low fiber between people who are ex are exposed to the same amount of alcohol. So that's the idea through adjustment mm -hmm. is to remove some of the effect of these confounding variables. And that, so there is a, a, st a st st statistical protocol called multivariate analysis. And the researchers use this to the best of their uh, ability. When it comes to the food frequency questionnaires, they do have their limitations, but they also validate them in that population to, if it's a good study, that's what they should be doing. They, they have tools to validate that food frequency questionnaire, which means going out and performing uh, a study to make sure that, as you say, you know, what people are reporting is reliable and there are methods of doing that. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, it's sort of, you know, they're not just going out and completely shooting in the dark. There are steps and processes within epidemiology to produce good e epidemiology. Um, and of course they can be bad epidemiology yeah. as well. And then above that, what's the next tier up? So above that is your randomized controlled trials. These are clinical interventions. And the idea here is that by having a clinical intervention, you can 
you can remove the effect of other variables other than what you're looking at. So it's very controlled. Perhaps you have two different groups and the only difference between those two groups is the exposure that you're looking at. Maybe it is, for example, the addition of fiber to a diet or the addition of a certain vegetable oil. Uh, and therefore you can have uh, a greater degree of confidence that the outcome that you're measuring is a result of the, the difference between those mm -hmm. two variables. The cause and effect. Yeah. And then above that, we have the these meta-analyses, right? Mm -hmm. Like where you take all of these studies that are of a certain ilk and lump them into one pile and kind of compare and contrast all of them to draw mm -hmm. even deeper conclusions. Yeah, so the idea is if you pull together 30 randomized controlled trials from around the world that are all looking at the same thing from different researchers in different labs, uh, and you pull them together and perform a, an analysis, you're, you're likely to, to, to reduce the chance of any bias um, that could be affecting any individual study. Uh, that said, uh, a meta-analysis is also, you know, there are, there are times where a meta-analysis can be performed poorly. It, it, you know, it, 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 it has to define what its inclusion criteria is and, and therefore what studies it includes. And if you put garbage in, you're going, you're going to get garbage yeah. out. Yeah. Um, so a meta-analysis, again, is not bulletproof. You still have to be able to look at it, understand uh, what the inclusion and exclusion criteria was, and, and then uh, you know, look at the results in the context of everything else. And that's the key here is that when, when you're reviewing the science and you're looking at any individual study, you then have to step back out and look at the totality of the evidence. Ideally, what we're looking for is converging lines. You know, the, the uh, mechanistic studies under the microscope and in the animals are pointing in the same direction as what the epidemiology is pointing in, is pointing in the same direction as what the clinical mm. intervention studies mm. are. Yeah, I think this is all really important. I mean, the reason I wanted to dive into this hierarchy of evidence is simply because I think it's important that people develop some level of, of evidentiary uh, literacy around mm -hmm. this, particularly when people are going online and they're reading stuff on Facebook or Twitter and somebody's promoting a certain diet or lifestyle and they're using study X, Y, or Z as evidentiary <laughs> proof of this it's important to understand, well, what kind of study was that? What are the circumstances under which it was conducted, et cetera. Um, and what you see with respect to the tribalism that abounds is uh, a certain group. And this, is, this cuts across every dietary tribe. Like they will throw an epidemiological study under the bus because that's trash, but then they'll cite one that supports mm -hmm. their perspective. And there's this kind of war of ideas that goes on um, where shots are fired across the bow mm. at each other, you know? And for the average consumer, it's like, I don't know, I'm not reading these studies. Mm -hmm. I'm not going on NBCI and like trying to figure all this stuff out. And, and it's really hard to find somebody who's coming from an, event, an, an objective point of view to help people parse all of this out. And, and I feel like you're um, a good actor in this space somebody who's willing to admit when they're wrong, who's teachable, who's learning as we go, sharing what you're finding along the way, calling out BS when you see it. Um, and that's a real public service. Hmm. Yeah, there's a lot of false equivalence is, is how I like to describe it, where you, you know, on social media, you know, everyone now, if you read the blog or <laughs> the post on social, first two words, study show <laughs> and yeah it's it's you know how can studies show such contradictory positions um and, and how can such contradictory positions exist uh so it is it's it's frustrating and 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 i can see from someone who's just trying to make sense of things that it's incredibly difficult and and i think many people are left with this idea that science isn't settled science doesn't understand what a healthy diet is. Look at all these different opinions that are out there. Uh, and then, you know, when you're in that position, it's, it's very easy to kind of just throw your hands up in the air and stick with 
with what you know and right, what you're comfortable with. Paralysis. Yeah. Um, so I do think it's important for people to understand this evidence hierarchy. Um, but equally speaking, you know, I think something that I've also uh, sort of grown to learn over time in, in, in trying to communicate this message is not to expect too much from, from the average person trying to make sense of this. And what I mean by that is people are busy. They, you know, they have their own careers and their own jobs and they're not like me sitting down and reading uh, nutrition science papers seven, eight hours a day and geeking out on them. And that's cool. They've got their own passions and, and, and interests. And this is, you know, we hear this kind of throwaway line of, of do your own research or I did my research. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, I kind, of, I kind of laugh sometimes when I hear that. Um, I mean, really doing your own research, if you think about that, that phrase literally would mean going and getting trained in a bachelor's and then becoming a professor and having a research question and then raising grant money and performing the research <laughs> and, yeah. and hiring the statist statisticians. I always, always fumble that word. Uh, and the, the research assistants and uh, performing the research. Uh, or it could be someone who's maybe not performing the research themselves, but is, is trained to, to read it and to get into the study and uh, understand exactly what they're looking at and to look at the exposure that I spoke about before mm -hmm. compared to what? If we're looking at a certain food or nutrient and we're looking at an outcome, what are we comparing it to? Such an important question that's, that's often overlooked. Uh, understanding the evidence hierarchy, being able to zoom out and think about the totality of the evidence, all of this stuff, I think it's, it's a big ask to ask the average person to, to be doing that on the regular to make sense of things. And, and this is where I think the, the consensus guideline papers from the American College of Cardiology or the um, you know, American College of Endocrinology or the American Cancer Society, these guideline papers are, they are those people who are conducting the research themselves, uh, who are trained to read the research, to understand the, the totality of the evidence and then provide recommendations. Um, and so, you know, when, when, when I see someone say, do your own research to someone, you know, I, I think that it's a little unfair. And I think in many ways, what's more constructive is just to point them to uh, a good resource where there are, you know, very credible, experienced people that okay. have been engaged to do exactly that. Right, do your own research often means, I found the guy who I like and I resonate with him. Mm. So, and, and I find him to be credible and believable. So, yeah, I'm, so I'm, I'm, on, on some level, there's a leap of faith and a level of trust hmm. that that person is telling me the straight truth. And the, you know, the, the less aware you are, I guess, of the way that science works, I think the more affected you can be by confirmation bias. And, and so it can be easy to just go and, and find the information that reinforces your current views, established views, your identity, and at the same time, turn a blind eye to anything that perhaps challenges that. Uh, and so, uh, you know, I think that right now, uh, <laughs> I, I empathize with the average person trying to make sense of what on earth to eat. Right. Um, and, you know, people are, are terribly confused and caught in the middle of all of this. So as somebody who has, you know, quote unquote, done the research, mm -hmm. like you're a guy who's done the research, uh, you've looked at the totality of evidence, you've extrapolated from that to develop this thesis that you spoke about um, earlier, which on some level I feel could be uh, said in more simple terms to be a plant predominant diet, mm -hmm. perhaps not a plant exclusive diet, although that's great, but a diet that leans in towards mostly plants. Mm -hmm. Is that fair? That's fair. So a plant predominant to a plant exclusive 
diet and you know why does this work well it's there's a twofold kind of effect going on here you're reducing your exposure to certain foods and nutrients that we know when consumed in excess will promote disease mm-hmm. things like saturated fat for example that are the most common source of saturated fats is in animal foods uh, you're reducing your exposure to certain carcinogenic compounds uh, you're at the same time reducing your exposure to ultra processed foods you know let's not forget that in this country 60 percent of the average person's calories come from ultra processed foods and in australia it's nearly 50 percent and similar in the uk and and in canada uh and we know it's you know we know from clinical intervention studies and we could go into that if you want to explore it that these ultra processed foods are hyper palatable they're they make it super easy to over consume calories you know they they promote hedonic hunger you know where we're consuming calories in the absence of a physiological requirement uh, and they're designed by food scientists to do that, to hit the bliss point. Uh, and they've done a good job um, if you look at the, the consumption levels. Um, so we, we're reducing our exposure to certain uh, parts of a diet that are promoting poor health. And then at the same time, we're increasing our exposure to fiber, right? And, you know, fiber is probably the most overlooked nutrient if there was one thing that i was going to say to people uh to focus on that would just straighten up their diet and would reduce their risk of so many of these diseases help them live healthier for longer it would be to get more fiber into their diet Mm -hmm. and i know you've had our mutual friend dr b yeah at your you know at your insistence earlier you were the guy (laughs) who was like you got to check this dude out and then i had him on of course he's a rock star yeah he's been on your show many times yeah so the forward to your book he wrote the forward and you know the microbiome is wild and uh you know in in, in many ways, what's going on in our microbiome and the loss of biodiversity reflects the, the macro world. And it's, it's no coincidence mm-hmm. that farming and food production is affecting both. Uh, so, you know, the introduction of more fiber to the, to the diet is, is crucial for nourishing the microbiome, for creating a healthy balance of the 38 trillion microbes that, that, call your large intestine their home uh, and when you're when you are nourishing them and feeding them they reward you and so that's that's obviously an extremely important benefit of increasing the, these plant foods in the diet uh, you're also in, increasing the amount of plant protein in your diet and we see very very consistently in large observational studies that look at substitution analyses what happens when you reduce animal protein in someone's diet and increase plant protein and we see dramatic reductions in the risk of all of these chronic diseases we see reductions in total mortality the risk of premature death so that's a a a huge benefit Mm -hmm. and perhaps perhaps one of the most important benefits is the exposure to all of these phytochemicals. And there are five, 10, 20,000 plus phytochemicals. You know, we haven't even yet identified all of them. And you've probably heard a, a, a lot about polyphenols and people probably immediately think of resveratrol in, in red wine um, or chlorogenic acids in coffee or curcumin in turmeric or catechins in green tea. These polyphenol compounds, while not essential nutrients, right? And and when I say not essential nutrients, they're not essential for your survival, but they are essential for promoting optimal health. And we know uh, just through work in the last 10 years that most of the polyphenols you eat actually pass through your small intestine they land in your large intestine and it's the microbiome it's the bacteria that that metabolize them Mm. and produce thousands of metabolites that have downstream effects through the body that are driving down inflammation both systemically also 
uh, in the central nervous system. Uh, and so as we're uh, making these changes to our diet and eating uh, in this more plant predominant pattern, this, this way of eating that the blue zones eat, Okinawans in, in Japan, uh, the Sardinians, the, the uh, folks in Loma Linda, who on average are living around 10 years longer than the uh, standard American, we are uh, producing the risk of these diseases through a range of risk factors that we're modifying. That's the key part here. By driving down cholesterol, by driving down blood pressure, by improving our insulin resistance. You know, all of, all of this stuff, along with uh, an anti-inflammatory diet that's, that is helping promote a more robust immune system, is creating a healthier body. Mm -hmm. So it's multifactored in the sense that moving towards a more plant-predominant diet, you're, you're crowding out space for some of those foods that are contributing to the ailments and the chronic lifestyle diseases. Um, but on top of that, by increasing the diversity of what that plant predominant diet looks like, you are enhancing health um, in no small part due to the fact that you're feeding your microbiome in a manner in which has all of these extra downstream impacts on health enhancement. Yeah, and let's, let's perhaps zoom in on the microbiome for a moment here. And not to repeat what you've done with Dr. B, but perhaps we can build on that. Uh, you know, the human, uh, the human body is made up of around 23,000 human genes, right? We have, there are around 100 times that many genes in our microbes. So we are genetically more microbe than we are human. And I think there's been some revision on the, on the maths around how many human cells are there to microbe cells. Right, yeah, there's been, there's, <laughs> there has been some changes. There's to been that. some changes yeah. and used to, used to be 10 to one. Uh, it was thought that it was 10 uh, microbial cells to one human cell. And that's been revised to uh, around 1.3 microbial cells to one human cell. It's a big change. It's a big change. Uh, but it still speaks to the fact that, you know, we are, in, from a cell point of view, we still have more microbial cells than we do have human cells. I mentioned before, there are around 38 trillion microbes in our gastrointestinal system. That is more stars than there are. That is more than the number of stars that are in the, in the Milky Way. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, 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 it's wild. Wrap your head around that number. Right. There's, there, there is a whole lot going in there that we have underappreciated for, for a long time. And the, these microbes, they rely on us and we rely on them. It's a symbiotic relationship. And you mentioned diversity and the reason why diversity of plants in the diet is important is that these, these, we have about 500 to 1,000 different species within our, within our gut of bacteria. And a more diverse microbiome is associated with better health. We see healthy people have a more diverse microbiome. Increasing the number of species of those microbes. Yes, yeah, so you, most people will have a sort of uh, predefined number of species between 500 to 1,000. And that is usually defined in the first three years of life, right? So uh, what in increasing diversity is really working with what you already have but it's increasing the prevalence of the healthy bacteria, the numbers of them, and suppressing, reducing the numbers of the pathogenic bacteria. Uh, I think, you know, perhaps a good analogy of this is thinking about society. Uh, when there's equal representation of people from different cultures, we have a better functioning society. You know, it's we where each each of these uh, people from diverse backgrounds are bringing different skills to the table. Uh, and 
Same thing in society. You know, there are, of course, a, a minority of people who get up to no good. Mm-hmm. And the pathogenic the citizens. Pathogenics. <laughs> and, and, you know, we want to keep them at bay, right? And that's the same thing with the microbiome. And so when you have better representation, essentially, uh, if, if you think about a football team as well, you could think about uh, on any given day, if, if a couple of players aren't performing their best, some of the other players can pick up the slack and you can still win the game. That's, that's what it means. When you have a more diverse microbiome, more robust, you're more likely to be winning in producing these compounds that are protecting your gut lining. And I'll go into that. These different species, essentially like you and I, have different food preferences, slightly different taste buds. And and so the prebiotics and the, the prebiotic fiber and the polyphenols and the resistant starch in certain foods will help promote the growth of certain species, but then other foods will help promote the growth of different species. And so when you have a diverse range of plants in your diet, you're keeping more of these guys happier. Mm-hmm. And as you feed them, they're, they're producing metabolites. So they, they ferment these, uh, these uh, food products that pass through undigested into the large intestine. And as they're fermenting them, they are producing these metabolites. There are thousands of these, but probably the most studied and spoken about are short-chain fatty acids. And of the short-chain fatty acids, butyrate probably gets most of the attention and kind of rightly so. Butyrate helps to keep the uh, mucosal layer of, of the gut intact, healthy, along with the endothelial cells, which sit you know, right between just a very thin layer of cells sit between all of the microbes, the 38 trillion microbes, and then 70% of your immune system. Mm. Which is important because we're seeing this rise in the incidence of, of conditions like ulcerative colitis, et cetera, all of these gut digestion mm-hmm. issues, which really relate to um, gut lining permeability. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I'm, if you look at the surge in autoimmune conditions and uh, you know uh, allergies, they've they've increased far too rapidly for that to be you know down to human genetics. Human genetics take a lot longer than that to change. You know we're talking hundreds of thousands, millions of years usually. So you know something else has changed, and uh, when we look at the the microbiome. It's clear that people who are uh, experiencing these types of autoimmune conditions, um, they tend to have dysbiosis. Uh, now, I think it would be far-fetched to, to say that a causal relationship has been established for some of these. Um, a lot of this is epidemiology and it's an association, but there are mechanisms that do uh, make sense. And so the idea is that if you have dysbiosis and you have uh, less of these short chain fatty acids being produced. And just to be clear, dysbiosis being a dysregulation of your, your, your like microbiome, your, your gut health in general. Yeah, so you've lost that diversity mm-hmm. and you get a, a relative uh, reduction in the, the, the healthful microbes and you get an increase in the pathogenic inflammatory microbes. And, and when this happens, you get breakdown of that mucosal layer, you get separation of the endothelial cells. So the endothelial cells are held together by tight junctions and butyrate, that short chain fatty acid that I mentioned, one of the functions that, that it has in the gut is to help keep those tight junctions in good health. And so as you get this more inflammatory uh, state in the gut, and this and dysbiosis, you get breakdown of that that layer. This is important because it allows the flow of molecules from the gut into the bloodstream that otherwise that that shouldn't be getting through the gut lining. Mm-hmm. And these you know, these are often referred to as bacterial endotoxins, and they they essentially travel into the bloodstream 
where they rev up the immune system. And when you're driving up inflammation, you're uh, increasing oxidative stress through the body and uh, oxidative stress leads to DNA damage. And then you're starting to accelerate the, the aging process of tissues. So what are the foods that are most butyrate promoting? Mm-hmm. Great question. Uh, have you heard of Professor Christopher Gardner? I don't think so. So uh, this, this brings us to a very uh, interesting study that just came out. He's a professor at Stanford and he was working with the Sonnenbergs. The Sonnenbergs are you know, arguably some of the, the leading microbiome scientists in the world. And oh, yeah, uh, is that a husband and wife? Yeah. yeah, yeah, I've heard of them. And they they just conducted uh, a really uh, eloquently designed study that took thirty eight adults, if my memory serves me correct, uh, and randomized them into two groups. And the idea was really to 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 see how fiber affects the microbiome and how fermented foods do. And of course, fermented foods contain probiotics. So the hypothesis was that maybe they improve diversity. Uh, and the idea is to, to test and see if there's a difference between fiber and fermented foods. And this was a 10 week study, okay? The, the subjects that were told to increase fiber, they increased their fiber from 20 grams to 40. The subjects in the fermented food group they were told to eat six serves of fermented foods a day. To give you an example, uh, uh, one kombucha was two serves. Mm -hmm. Uh, There was sauerkraut, there was kefir, there was some yogurt. uh, There was about five or six different uh, probiotic rich fermented foods. And the the results of this study were, were really interesting because there was some findings that I guess challenged the idea that fiber leads to increased diversity, right? Um, In the fermented food group, we'll start there. They saw across the board, you know, aggregate increases in, in microbial diversity and really impressive increases. So uh, a, a real, um, strong finding in it and a, a good reason to add more fermented foods to your diet. They also measured markers of inflammation and they measured uh, around 200 odd. So a very comprehensive look at inflammatory markers. And they saw that the fermented foods drove down inflammatory proteins, 19 of them specifically. So the introduction of fermented foods was leading to a better immune response. Um, and decreasing inflammation in the body. Now, the, the fiber group, very interesting. There was an individualized response. So if you look at, at the aggregate, uh, just the average, the, the fiber group did not see an increase in microbiome diversity. Mm. And that that's an interesting finding. And uh, you kind of have to dig into the study to, to make sense of, of that. Right, why um, would that be? I mean, that upends prior mm-hmm. conclusions yeah, around that. It does. Uh, and when you, when you dig into the study, and, and I've spoken with, uh, with Dr. Gardner uh, about this, there were some individuals who handled the increase in fiber really well, and they saw an increase in diversity. And then there were some who didn't and actually saw an increase in inflammation. Mm. And they thought this was really interesting because this finding is kind of in spite of of previous understanding. And what they found was when they went back and looked at baseline diversity, the people who, who didn't respond so great to increasing fiber, they essentially had very poor diversity to begin with. Okay. And so there are a couple of hy- hypotheses from this study. It's not to write off fiber at all. Um, it's just to say that maybe in certain circumstances, 
jacking your fiber up from 20 grams to 40 grams overnight is not ideal for some people. And perhaps they need tools and strategies to increase their diversity first before they're increasing. Mm -hmm. And so one of the hypotheses is that if your microbiome is really struggling and you don't have diversity, perhaps you have a long history of using antibiotics, for example, and you've been eating a lot of ultra processed foods and living a very high stressed life. We know that stress affects the microbiome as well. Then perhaps it could be a better strategy to introduce uh, fermented foods first, mm -hmm. increase some diversity, and then start to add more, more plant diversity and more fiber into the diet when your gut is in a better position to be able to handle it. How long was the study conducted for? So this was 10 a 10-week study. Right. Yeah, it would be interesting to see how that would play out over six months. Perhaps <laughs> if you just continue to eat fiber mm -hmm. at some point, your microbiome locks in on that, but that idea of of fermented foods kind of turbocharging things mm. and getting you prepared to be in a position to take advantage of additional fiber in your diet, I think is super interesting. Yeah, so I think they're, they're gonna go and test that. Uh, and, and they may even look at uh, a probiotic supplement, mm. I believe as well. Uh, but the other thing to consider here, and your point's a great one, because duration of this study is important, you know, and that was one thing they commented on. Perhaps it, over longer exposure, the microbiome would have adapted and been better able to, to handle that increase mm -hmm. in fiber, and then you would see proliferation of the bacteria. Uh, but the other thing I think that's important here is that it was an overnight jump from 20 to 40 grams. Would it have been different if it was a very slow progression? Steep, yeah, yeah. Stepped, yeah. So look, it, some of that is, is, you know, remains to be seen, but that's the beautiful thing about science. It's, it's constantly evolving. Uh, we know that, you know, from the, the gut microbiome uh, project, which is led by uh, a microbiome uh, researcher, Rob Knight, you know, he, he has this huge project and has has uh, been creating this database where uh, people send in their stool um, samples and he and and also uh, send in information about what they eat. And he's been able to create uh, a really cool library. And we know from that that compared to people who are eating ten or fewer plants per week, those that are eating thirty or more have much more diversity in their microbiome. Mm -hmm. So and that's Dr. B's whole thing. Like if you're gonna do one thing, increase the diversity mm -hmm. of plants on your plate. Yeah, so I think that recommendation still stands. Uh, I guess the, the only thing that I would add there is that the process to increasing that diversity, <clears throat> it might look a little different depending on what someone's baseline diversity looks like. Sure, and the clickbait title version of that would be forget about fiber, it's all about fermented foods, mm. right? A and, simplified. <laughs> and that happened. Yeah, uh, I did, I'm sure So that did, happened yeah. and uh, the Hannah, I can't remember Hannah's surname, but this was, this study was part of her PhD and I've heard her speak and she kind of uh, had a bit of a laugh about that because that's not what the study showed. Sure. Um, it's a, it is a lot more nuanced than that. Mm, as the world tends to be, so, <laughs> right? Um, that's fascinating. Is there a way, I wanna switch gears in a minute, but to kind of put a pin in this, is there a way, what's the best way for somebody to figure out what the diversity of their microbiome looks like? Are there tests, can mm -hmm. you like, get a stool sample or something like that? How does that work? Yeah, there are a couple of different companies that that are doing this. I'm not sure how reliable they are yet. I'm told that they're getting more and more reliable. So I actually, this is a, a, a great question because I think this could be uh, a key part in helping people work out what, what steps they should take. Yep. Right, but in the meantime, a good rule of thumb is increase both your fiber and your fermented foods. Yeah, and and you know you you may need to experiment a little bit with that to to work with your body and listen to your body. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think certainly the key finding from that study is that fermented foods are beneficial. 
and yeah. all of us should be eating more uh, kimchi and, and sauerkraut. And, uh, you know, if you eat animal products and you eat dairy, then I would argue that fermented dairy is probably the best of the, the dairy options. Uh, so, and, and I do think that some of that technology that you just spoke to, it will uh, become better over time. I think Zoe is one that's out there. Uh, I'm not sure whether they report so much on diversity in terms of a diversity score for the person, but they do take a stool sample and they do recommend foods. Mm. Uh, and that's, that's being led by uh, Tim Spector, who is certainly a, a sort of prominent expert in this space. Zoe. Zoe. That's what it's called Zoe. Yeah. Um, final question on this point. Uh, how, what is your sense of the efficacy of store-bought kombucha products? Mm -hmm. You know, you see them, you know, advertised with, um, you know, a certain number, uh, you know, attached to what that uh, culture looks like. Mm -hmm. But then I think, well, these things are, are you know, pasteurized on some mm -hmm. level, like, Am I really, like I, I could make kombucha at home and we've done mm. that. I'm sure the ones we make at home are gonna be more efficacious than what I'm buying at the store. But I've often just thought like, this is probably not doing anything. It's more, mm. it's more of a, you know, placebo type situation, but I don't know if you look yeah. at that I'm, or are there I'm, studies on this? I'm with you. I don't think there are uh, studies on that, but uh, I choose the raw, non-pasteurized kombucha. Mm -hmm. You can find a few of those. There are some here that I found in California uh, for that reason. I think if you're pasteurizing them and heating them, then you know you it defeats are- the whole entire purpose of it, the whole thing. Yeah, those microbes are likely being killed. Uh, now in saying that, to, to add a, a layer of, of complexity to this, uh, there is a lot of research now looking at uh, dead microbes and these are often called postbiotics. And uh, there are some studies showing benefit even through the consumption of, of dead uh, probiotics. Mm. So uh, that's interesting. I don't think we, we fully understand, uh, you know, is pasteurized kombucha and perhaps the dead cultures that are in there, is that exerting benefit um, within our garden downstream. So I think my advice would be you're, to either try and make your own or to look for one that is a raw, non-pasteurized kombucha. Yeah, get your scoby going at home. Yeah. Um, switching gears, I wanna talk about saturated fat. When you articulated your thesis at the, at the beginning of the show, a big piece in that was the reduction of saturated fat. And when we talk about saturated fat, this is a hot button, you know, hotly debated thing, particularly on social media, depending upon your particular dietary tribe of choice. Um, the overwhelming evidence from my perspective uh, of, of valid objective science is pretty clear that saturated fat, no bueno, contributing mm -hmm. to heart disease and other um, not so good health outcomes. So walk us through your sense of the science with respect to dietary uh, saturated fat intake, the impact that it has mm. and why we should be reducing it. How far back should we go? I don't know. <laughs> we got as long as you want. <laughs> There's a great study from 1908. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that still holds up? Yeah, well, it's interesting because pre-1908, uh, atherosclerosis, a lot of what we're talking about when we're talking about saturated fat is uh, its effect on LDL cholesterol and then the effect that that has on the accumulation of fat in your artery, the development of uh, plaque, you know, in science called atherosclerosis, which then puts you at high risk of having a heart attack or a stroke. Uh, and prior to, to 1908, However, the prevailing sort of idea around cardiovascular disease was that it was just a process of aging mm -hmm. and it wasn't necessarily driven through a dietary exposure. And there was, uh, this early research goes back to Russia. Um, these Russian <laughs> scientists were, were in the lab, uh, the first ones really doing work in this space. And, and uh, there was a researcher last name Ignatowski and he uh, fed uh, meat and uh, dairy products to a rabbit. 
and was able to to see that um, that rabbit developed fatty streaks in its arteries. And that was really the the very first study that was like, hang on, maybe the development of fatty streaks, atherosclerosis that we're seeing in humans is not just aging. However, from that study, the hypothesis was that it was animal protein. And about four or five uh, years later, 1913, Nikolai Anichkov, uh, quite a famous name in the sort of science world for cardiovascular disease, another Russian, he he was looking at the the fatty streaks in arteries and could see that there was a lot of cholesterol in there. And so he had a hypothesis that maybe in that 1908 study, maybe it was cholesterol that was in those foods and it wasn't protein that was causing this uh, arterial plaque to, to form. So he ran a study uh, again with a rabbit and he, he, he used a sun, one group were fed a sunflower seed oil and one were fed sunflower seed oil with cholesterol in it. And uh, he was able to see that uh, quite clearly the rabbits that were fed the sunflower oil with cholesterol dissolved into it developed the fatty streaks and the, the sort of um, pathogenesis that goes on to become uh, the pathology that goes on to become atherosclerosis. Now, that, that research then was, was really groundbreaking. Uh, but what happened was immediately after that, some other researchers and he decided to look at replicating that study in rats and in dogs. So again, feeding dietary cholesterol to these animals and looking to see if there was any buildup of this fat in the arteries. And what they, what they found was there wasn't. And so they, they thought this was a bit of an anomaly. Maybe it's just something that happens in a rabbit, which is a herbivore. And there was no further science done for quite some time. Now, the key thing that was overlooked there was that in the rabbit model, the rabbit was fed something, it increased the LDL cholesterol in that rabbit, which then had led to the, the buildup of the fatty streak. Mm -hmm. The rat and the, the, the dog models, the reason there was no fatty, fatty buildup in the artery was because they metabolized cholesterol differently. And so the consumption of dietary cholesterol didn't increase their cholesterol levels in their blood. Mm. And so, uh, having sort of overlooked that and also the fact that all of this was published in Russian, um, it was kind of parked by, uh, by the Russians there and, and wasn't seen by the rest of the world. And then 20 or 30 years later uh, is when some American researchers, Kinsell and Keyes, uh, they, were, they were looking at metabolic ward studies where they're bringing people in and uh, they wanted to see if they could identify what components of the diet would increase cholesterol levels in the blood. Because the idea at that, that point in time was that high cholesterol, serum cholesterol, was driving heart disease. And you've got to remember, cardiovascular disease peaked in the 1950s. Mm -hmm. This was... You know, there was essentially a national inquiry following um, the president of America, President Roosevelt. He died of heart disease in 1944. And so these guys were running these metabolic ward studies and they were able to very clearly show in humans, when you feed someone saturated fat, you increase the levels of LDL cholesterol in their blood. On the other hand, when you feed someone polyunsaturated fats, you will drive down their cholesterol. In fact, in their calculation, what they were able to deduce was that saturated fat will increase, uh, will increase cholesterol at a rate of around twice as much as polyunsaturated fat will lower it. They were also able to tease out that dietary cholesterol in humans 
while it, it doesn't have as significant effect as saturated fat, it still does affect cholesterol levels. And they came up with uh, a calculation that still stands to this day. It still stands to this day. The more saturated fats in the diet and the less polyunsaturated fats, the higher someone's LDL cholesterol levels are. And thus incidence of atherosclerosis. Yes. So uh, what we know uh, is that the higher your LDL cholesterol and the longer you're exposed to that over a lifetime, the higher your risk is to develop atherosclerosis. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there, there's an interesting study uh, out of Spain called the PISA study. And uh, the, this study essentially took 4,000 healthy adults and they used ultrasound to look at the plaque in their arteries. And these were, these were healthy adults without cardiovascular disease. And the recommendations in this country and around the world are LDL cholesterol should be around 100 milligrams per deciliter. Uh, and so they, they ultrasounded all of these different participants who had varying LDL cholesterol levels. And what they found was that even at that 100 milligrams per deciliter level, which we consider to be normal, but we consider it to be normal in, in quite a, an unhealthy population. What they found was that it, at that level, 40% of people had atherosclerosis. Mm. And it wasn't until you got down to around 50, 60, 70 milligrams per deciliter, did you see people without atherosclerosis. Right. So a couple observations. First, wasn't there a study done on um, young soldiers who had died in World War One, where they autopsied mm -hmm. them and they realized, perhaps for the first time, that mm -hmm. young people had these fatty mm -hmm. streaks in their in their cardiovascular system? Yeah, it was the Korean uh, War, I believe. Mm -hmm. Oh, Korean War, and okay. uh, around seventy percent of the American soldiers who were they were killed from from gunfire. Right. These are like eighteen to yeah, twenty four or whatever. Right? Uh, they around seventy percent of them had had atherosclerosis. Sorry to interrupt the flow. We'll be right back with more awesome, but I want to snag a moment to talk to you about the importance of nutrition. The thing is, most people I know actually already know how to eat better and aspire to incorporate more whole plants, more fruits, vegetables, seeds, beans, and legumes into their daily routine. Sadly, however, without the kitchen tools and support, very few end up sticking with it. So because adopting a plant-based diet transformed my life so profoundly and because I want everybody to experience some version of what I've experienced, we decided to tackle and solve this very common problem. The solution we've devised, I'm proud to say, is the Plant Power Meal Planner, our affordable all-in-one digital platform that sets you up for nutrition excellence by providing access to thousands of highly customizable, super delicious, and easy to prepare plant-based recipes. Everything integrates with automatic grocery delivery and you get access to our amazing team of nutrition coaches seven days a week and many other features. To learn more and to sign up, visit meals.richroll.com. And right now for a limited time, we're offering $10 off an annual membership when you use the promo code RRHealth at checkout. This is life-changing stuff, people, for just $1.70 a week, literally the price of a cup of coffee. Again, that's meals.richroll.com, promo code RRHealth for $10 off an annual membership. All right, let's get back to the show. And then the second thing uh, that I wanted to bring up, you mentioned Ansel Keys. I mean, this is a guy who is legendary for his breakthrough science, but also somebody who has a scarlet letter attached to him. Mm -hmm. There's a whole narrative around this guy being a quack and why we shouldn't pay any attention to anything that he discovered. And this, and this narrative is being propagated by a different dietary tribe, like the sort of carnivore and mm -hmm. low carb community of people. So walk us through, you know, truth and fiction when it comes to Ansel Keys, where he sits in the canon of legitimate, verifiable science that's trustworthy mm -hmm. versus uh, this idea that he should be dismissed for reasons X, Y, and Z. Mm -hmm. 
you know, if, if, if you take a position that carbohydrates are to blame for all of disease and you blame the, the 1980 guidelines, which are quite notorious, uh, you know, everyone refers to them as the guidelines that came out, told people to eat low fat and, and look what happened. Mm-hmm. You know, population got sicker and sicker. If, if you take the position that never mind that people didn't follow those that's guidelines, right. but anyway yeah we ahead. should we should get into that yeah. that's that's really important uh if you take that position then you you need a scapegoat you need someone to blame who's responsible for this and unfortunately ansel keys is that fall guy uh for for a lot of people and they they blame him for the development of the low fat guidelines that came out in in 1980 now, if you go back and look at, at Key's work, you know, I would say, you know, arguably he has made the greatest contribution to nutrition science in the last hundred years. You know, this relationship between saturated fat and cholesterol and atherosclerosis is the most solid relationship that exists today. If that's wrong, then we need to throw out all of nutrition science. And, you know, People think that he just performed this seven country study. But as I just mentioned then, he started before that in the metabolic wards. He started in metabolic ward trials, very controlled settings, bringing people in, feeding them different fats, exposing them to animal fats, to vegetable oils, and looking what happens to their cholesterol. From there, he was able to create a hypothesis he could see that the saturated fats, animal fats were driving up cholesterol. Now he wanted to go out in the real world and look at populations that exist and compare those populations eating lots of animal fats with high cholesterol. What's their cardiovascular uh, disease incidence like compared to other populations eating less animal fats with lower cholesterol? And you know, prior to the seven country study is, you know, what he's no, most known for. And uh, prior to that, he, he conducted a, uh, a, he did a speech at a conference and he put up on, on a chart, he put up the saturated fat intake and level of cardiovascular disease from six countries, right? And, uh, you know, people today say, look at that and say, well, he cherry picked those six countries. Mm -hmm. There was actually 22. Now, uh, in Key's defense, he chose those six countries because that's, that's where the best data was. He wasn't happy with the, the, the data from the other countries. You remember this is back in the ninth, late 1950s, you know? So some of the population data wasn't that great. Now, the, the main point here is that, uh, some some folks at that time who were arguing with Ansel Keys said that in actual fact there's 22 countries, and they produced a graph which is very famous now. You'll see the six versus the 22, and the 22 didn't actually refute what Ansel Keys was saying. It just made the association a little weaker, mm-hmm. right? Now, and the reason that he did not focus on those other countries was that the data was error ridden or incomplete because of reporting inconsistencies mm. or just issues related to creating verifiable data sets. Yeah, how how verifiable it is. You know, there were problems with diagnoses, for example, in countries and and how they were categorizing the the uh, the deaths for certain people. Right. And uh, but I think what's really important is that when he went to conduct set up the seven country study, he invited many, many countries. And this is overlooked. He's written about this. He wanted to work with established nutrition scientists in these countries. And essentially he even invited France, which often gets brought up and they declined. So he was working with those that that accepted the invitation and had had established nutrition science uh, centers who could conduct the research with him. It was a collaboration. And so there were uh, seven countries chosen 
And within that, there were 16 cohorts. Um, these countries were the USA, there was uh, Finland, there was uh, Greece, there was Yugoslavia, uh, which today has been uh, separated. Um, there was Japan uh, and there was the Netherlands. Mm -hmm. That's the seven countries. And then within those, some of those countries had multiple cohorts. There ended up being 16 different cohorts. And the really nice thing about this study was that there was, uh, there was great uh, differences in the amount of saturated fat between these cohorts. You need that contrast. If you're just looking at lots of populations and their saturated fat consumption is very similar, then you're not providing enough contrast to, to see whether high versus low saturated fat consumption is affecting heart disease. So he conducted this research uh, and, you know, it was able to establish uh, relatively quickly that countries like Greece and Japan who had low saturated fat intake around six to eight percent of calories had significantly lower incidence of heart disease compared to countries like the Netherlands and the USA and Finland mm -hmm. who had saturated fat intakes around 16 to 20 percent of calories. Wow. So what we what we glean from that is a pretty clear picture of the relationship between saturated fat intake and uh, heart disease incidence that holds up to this day. And the research around this relationship has only continued to kind of build on that mm. premise. Yeah, like that's, that was just the start. <laughs> right. You know, that's, there's, there's been, extensive research since then. And I should add that, you know, what, another criticism that, that, that Keyes often gets is that he, he was not paying attention to refined carbohydrates. And, you know, that's, that's not true. His, his own studies show that there is a relationship between refined carbohydrates and cardiovascular disease, but that association is weaker. It is weaker than saturated fat cardiovascular disease. Mm. And in fact, in 1968, when, when Keyes was providing recommendations for Scandinavian dietary guidelines, limiting refined sugars was one of his recommendations. Mm. Uh, and he wasn't just this guy that was obsessed just with saturated fat. You know, that was very much the start of his work. And over the, over the course of his work, uh, his, you know, he, he's, he's most well known for being an advocate of the Mediterranean dietary pattern. And he's the one that, that went on to describe that dietary pattern, as I referred to earlier, as a, a sort of largely vegetarian diet with, uh, you know, modest amounts of fish and, and dairy. So when we see the carnivore diet proponents out there, mm -hmm. the Paul Saladinos and the Sean Bakers, advocating for this notion that everything you ever thought you knew about saturated fat is wrong, saturated mm -hmm. fat is your friend. What are they hanging their hat on in terms of, of you know, establishing that this is not harmful? Compared to what, Rich? I don't know, you tell me. That's the million dollar question here. Uh, you know, there are a, a, a bunch of, of meta-analyses that seem to make saturated fat look okay. And you can do that depending on what you compare it to. And uh, I said before, there's been, you know, mountains of evidence that have come out since the seven country study. And part of that has been teasing out exactly this. You know, if you swap uh, calories from saturated fat for calories in uh, refined carbohydrates, then that's a, it's a lateral move. You know, it could even increase risk of cardiovascular mm -hmm. disease. Yeah, and and you're kind of alluding to there was a study that 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 garnered a lot of press that said saturated fat, you know, isn't related the to heart pure disease. Study. It, was, it was really yeah, exactly. And but what it really said was um, maybe it's not quite as bad as we originally thought, mm -hmm. but it's still bad. Is that a how do you interpret that? The way I interpret. The, the pure study in particular is that, you know, this was a, a, a multi-country study and, uh, you know, there are always some limitations when you're comparing different socioeconomic classes. And 
in that study, the the people that were eating less saturated fat were tending to eat diets below the poverty line. And they were, you know, diets that contained a lot of refined carbohydrates, very little diversity. And sure, in a diet like that, the addition of some animal fats may, may improve their health. You know, I wouldn't argue against that. But consistently, if you look at what happens if you swap calories from saturated fat for polyunsaturated fats, like vegetable oils or nuts and seeds or even fatty fish, or for monounsaturated fats, or for whole grains, you see that you drive down heart disease risk. So the, I think the key takeaway point here is you can make saturated fat look good. It depends what you're comparing it with. And whether removing saturated fat from your diet is healthy or not depends what you're replacing it with. Mm -hmm. If you are replacing it with nuts, seeds, uh, fatty fish, if you eat seafood, uh, or whole grains, then you are going to be lowering your risk of heart disease. Yeah, another talking point that gets thrown around from those communities. I feel like they've pivoted a little bit away from the saturated fat thing. And now it's all about vilifying seed oils. Mm. Like that's become like the evil culprit in this mm -hmm. whole thing in a very reductionist way. So walk me through that argument and kind of where things stand in terms of not just seed oils, but also the whole conversation around the health implications of of oil in the diet, you know, whether mm. we're talking about the Esselstyn, you know, super, you know, no to low oil plant based diet, to people who are very kind of you know pro olive oil mm -hmm. and all of that. I mean, that's a that's a large, yeah. large big question. Maybe but, we start with yeah. the uh, sort of omega six rich vegetable oil, seed oils, and then we'll go into olive oil and the vegan diet, mm -hmm. the low fat vegan diet. Uh, you know, the, the, that rhetoric around omega-6 oils being to, to blame, seed oils being to blame for disease. I, it's something I've studied super closely because it really, it really intrigues me uh, because I find it incredibly hard to see how someone can take that position from an evidence-based point of view. Um, but I think this is a prime example where emotions and facts don't mix very well. And uh, when you're really affected by emotions, it can affect objectivity. And so I said before the 1980 guidelines came out and a lot of people will say that those guidelines pushed people off of animal fats and pushed them towards seed oils and vegetable oils. Right, being a primary ingredient in ultra processed foods. Sure, and I would be the first person to put my hand up and say that, you know, seed oils within ultra processed foods, I don't think anyone should be eating more ultra processed foods, but we need to remember there is much more than just seed oils in those ultra processed foods. They're, they're added, you know, there's added sugar and there's added salt and a whole lot of other additives. Mm -hmm. um, Refined grains too. That's right. So where where does this idea that that omega sixes seed oils are inflammatory are causing disease come from let's go back to the evidence hierarchy so i think firstly from an uh, uh an anecdotal point of view a lot of people who uh believe that seed oils are bad they've removed ultra processed foods from their diet and they feel better so I understand that that's, again, that's, that's their lived experience, but I think they're wrongly attributing that benefit um, to, to the reduction of seed oils when in fact it's just the removal of ultra processed foods from their diet. If you look at uh, the strongest kind of arguments for omega-6 as being inflammatory, all of this is in vitro animal study science and as we mentioned earlier, not everything that happens at that level plays out in, in humans. Um, and we know from significant amounts of randomized controlled trials, randomized controlled trials, if, if people substitute saturated fat for vegetable oils or seed oils, they reduce their risk of heart disease. That's the first thing. The second is that omega-6s, when you consume them, the, the body 
desaturates and elongates them into a biological, biologically active form. A bit like what happens to omega-3s. People have probably heard that plant-based omega-3s go through a similar pathway where they're converted to DHA and EPA. Same thing happens with omega-6s. And along this pathway, when you consume omega-6s, which is linoleic acid, this is a, a fat that is uh, quite concentrated in seed oils. Along that pathway, a, a, a fat called arachidonic acid is produced. And the idea at a, from a mechanism point of view is that this is a precursor to inflammatory compounds. But when we look at human intervention studies, if you feed people seed oils, you don't get an increase in arachidonic acid. You don't see it. Secondly, if you feed people omega-6 linoleic acid, you do not get an increase in inflammatory biomarkers. That's probably the most important thing for us to think about here. It just doesn't happen. Mm. Despite the putative mechanism and what you see in in vitro or animal studies, it doesn't play out in human studies. And then if you zoom right out and you look at large population studies and you look at people consuming more linoleic acid or who have higher amounts of linoleic acid in their tissues, they have lower risk of cardiovascular disease and lower risk of total mortality. But would that not be, to play devil's advocate, another example of compared to what? Is not the conventional wisdom still, like you, you know, what I've heard for years is most people are consuming way too much omega-6 and it's all about the ratio or proportion of omega-6 intake to omega-3. And we're being told to increase our omega-3s and reduce our omega-6 to bring that into kind of proper relationship. Is that still the still the, the scientific, you know, sort of perspective or is this new studies that have changed that? I, I don't think that is the position today. Uh, I think that overwhelmingly, there is overwhelming evidence to, to show that, that that ratio where I do think it is important is that the, the omega-6 pathway and the omega-3 pathway share enzymes. And so there is a possibility if you have a lot of omega-6s in your diet, then you're using up all those enzymes and you may struggle to convert the omega-3s from ALA to DHA and EPA. So uh, mm, I don't think that's been fully borne out in the science other than to say, I think there is some evidence, uh, particularly uh, people with chronic inflammation like rheumatoid arthritis, that does seem to be a benefit for them to lower omega-6s mm. in their diet. Mm -hmm. But overall, if you, if you look uh, you know, at the human health outcome data, when you're feeding healthy adults, omega-6s in quite large volumes, you're not dialing up inflammation. And when we look at a population level, people that are consuming a lot of these omega-6s, as I said, they do have lower risk of cardiovascular disease, lower risk of premature death. Is that provided those omega-6s are not prepackaged in an ultra processed mm -hmm. food where there's all these other factors to consider? Yeah, I think so. And, and, and that's kind of where I land on this. I, I, I certainly, I mean, firstly, I'm not sort of pro seed oils right. or pro, yeah, yeah, yeah. pro yeah. vegetable oils. You don't yeah, have let's, to Let's eat make them. that clear. Cause I, it yeah. does sound like, hey, like no problem no, with, with what, omega-6s, what I'm, knock yourself out what, with seed oils. What, what I'm saying is, uh, you know, I just don't think they're the poison that, that they're made out to be. Mm-hmm. Um, I certainly don't think that we should be increasing our exposure to ultra processed foods, uh, but I don't think we need to generate the fear over vegetable oils and certainly don't need to, to blame the increased burden of chronic disease since 1980. Um, that's not from people swapping butter with a vegetable oil in their cooking. Yeah. Um, you know, it's, it, it's, it's a lot more complex than that since 1980, um, you know, the consumption of these ultra processed foods has increased, sure. uh, you know, hu hugely. Um, and, you know, as I said, I'm not a huge uh, sort of pro <laughs> seed right. oil person. And 
you know, uh, particularly, you know, if someone's watching their weight, I think all oils are very calorie dense and we need to be mindful of that. They, um, you know, they're, they're bringing about 120 calories per tablespoon. So they're quite easy to, to over consume. Um, you mentioned olive oil and the vegan diet. Yeah. I mean, within the plant-based vegan, you know, world, there are, there are, um, sub communities within that, um, that are at odds with each other over the health implications mm. of, of including something like olive oil in the diet. On the one hand, you have Caldwell Esselstyn in his camp that is very anti-oil. That's a contingent of people who are, are, are primarily focused on preventing and reversing heart disease. And you know, Caldwell somebody who's treating people for the most part who are very ill. Uh, then you have, and, and he's very adamant in that perspective and has done his studies and written books about this. And then on the other end, you have a different contingent of, uh, of people that include like Danielle Bellardo and some other folks who are saying the, st- the science doesn't bear out the negative health implications of, of olive oil on a plant-based diet. We vilified this. Um, there is there is space and room within a healthy plant-based diet to include this. Where you know what say you, sir? So I guess uh, firstly, the likes of Dean Ornish and and Dr. Esselstyn, you know these guys are giants, yeah, just legends, and 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 they have uh, done so much good for health across the globe. You know, reach millions and millions of people, and uh, their diets work. Um, you know, I, I I am of the of the view that there is no definitive evidence that the addition of olive oil, for example, to a plant based diet makes it inferior, and perhaps it could make it superior um, in some ways. And you know, I think uh, if you look at say Dean Ornish's uh, study, for example, um, I think people look at that and see, or even Esselstyn's study, that there was no oil uh, in those studies and therefore that must be why they got the results that they did. Uh, but, you know, in the case of Dean Ornish, you, you, you have to realize that compared to the control group, there was many changes. It wasn't just- Well, the, there were a lot of lifestyle changes that they made that were part of that. Mm-hmm. And he's never tried to- you know, say otherwise. Exactly. Well. And I mean, just from a, a dietary point of view, there were many changes. There were, you know, the people increasing their fruit and vegetable consumption and decreasing their animal product consumption. Uh, and, and the removal of oil was just one change of many. So you would really need a third arm in that study to uh, try and independently tease out the effects of oil. Uh, and and in fact, you would need to change the study design a little bit to remove the exercise and the stress component and all these other variables that could be affecting the outcome. Um, so I think that that there's a little bit of kind of over extrapolation from from that study, uh, and also Esselstyn's uh, uh, study as well. But that was that's an oil free diet. Um, there are some nuances with that study that are uh, still debated, but I don't think we need to, to sort of go into that. Um, the if you then zoom out and look at you know other studies like PrediMed, and PrediMed was a study of around seven thousand people, primary prevention, so they didn't have heart disease, and they uh, they had a control group, standard care, standard diet. Uh, they had two intervention groups. These were Mediterranean diets, one with oil and one with nuts, uh, olive oil, I should say. And uh, they, they saw over a five-year period, those in the Mediterranean groups had around a 30% reduction in cardiovascular disease uh, events. And there was no difference between the Mediterranean group that had nuts added or the Mediterranean group that had olive oil uh, added. So... Um, you know that kind of uh, speaks to to the the fact that olive oil can be included in a, a heart healthy diet. Uh, you know, it's not to say that there's not going to be a future study that does look at the independent effects of of olive oil in a completely plant based diet mm-hmm. uh, and shows a difference. But you know, at this stage, I think uh, you know 
it's it's kind of the least of most people's concerns. Yeah. You know, the the most important things are driving saturated fat down. We know that the inclusion of of polyunsaturated fats, as I spoke to earlier from those metabolic ward studies, is actually very important. These polyunsaturated fats are inherently beneficial. They will help to lower cholesterol. Uh, so their inclusion through nuts and seeds or olive oil, if that's right for you, I think is a good idea. Right. So when someone hits you up and says, Simon, I I hear everything you're saying, you make a lot of sense, but I've been on a low carb diet or I've been on a keto diet and I'm having great results. I feel great. I've lost a bunch mm -hmm. of weight. What is your response to that? Like, how do you think about low carb diets, mm -hmm. the keto diet, et cetera, um, in contrast to a higher carb plant-based diet. I might just add one thing to the oil. Mm -hmm. We'll hold that thought because yeah. I just remembered something that I think is important. Sure. Uh, the, there are some studies showing that oil impairs endothelial cell function. And you may have heard that before. Uh, and it's these are acute studies looking at when you feed someone oil, what happens you know, in the postprandial period after they consume that oil to their endothelial cell function. And you see that uh, it is impaired. Uh, and that is often science that people point to, to say, hey, look. Impaired in what way? What does that mean? Well, you get uh, a, a change in blood flow, um, a negative change in blood flow. Mm. Uh, and so uh, the, the idea here is that um, the consumption of oil is negatively affecting the endothelial cell uh, function. Endothelial cells line the arteries. And if this is happening acutely, maybe it explains what's happening chronically. Right. Yeah, um, but there, there is some, I guess, some issues with this train of thought. Um, you know, exercise also acutely impairs endothelial <laughs> cell function and so does sleep. So, um, it's, it's, it's interesting, but I guess we have to, to consider that not everything that happens acutely is representative of what happens chronically. Mm -hmm. uh, and sometimes an acute stress can actually lead to an, an, a, an adaptation and a benefit mm -hmm. in, the, in the long term. So I think that's worthwhile adding. Mm. Um, all right, so on to the next thing that I asked you about. Mm. Low, low carb versus high carb. Basically. From a, a, a weight loss point of view, uh, there is a, a plethora of studies that have essentially shown there is no significant benefit to either. <laughs> and uh, some of the, the probably the best design studies come from Professor Chris, Christopher Gardner out of Stanford. Uh, he, he initially ran a study in the early 2000s called the A to Z study. And this, this featured Atkins, it, it featured uh, the zone diet, the learn diet and the Ornish diet. All of these have a different ratio of macronutrients. So some of them are low carb, some are, are high carb. And 12 month trial, uh, you know, by the end of that, that 12 months, there was no significant difference between Atkins and Ornish. Mm. And Atkins is the lowest carb and Ornish is the highest carb. Strictly through the rubric of weight loss. So this is strictly through the rubric of weight loss. And the idea with this, this was they had dietitians who would use the most prominent books, so the, the Atkins book and the Ornish book at the time, mm -hmm. to educate people on how to adopt these diets. Uh, and and that's so what this was done a while ago. Then this is those done. Books like the Zone Diet was like in the early nineties, right? Yeah. So this was done, I think, in two thousand and three. Mm -hmm. uh, and there was a very interesting finding, though, Rich, from this study, and that was that within the groups, so within the, the low carb and within the high carb, some people did really well, and some people did really poorly. So there was this sort of wide variation. And Christopher Gardner was left thinking, well, I wonder what explains that. Why would, why would some people do really well on low carb, some do really poorly, and the same for high carb. And he thought maybe it's genetics or perhaps it's insulin resistance, how well your body can, can utilize 
glucose, carbohydrates. And so he went away and got funding and ran a, another study, a larger study, 600 people, again, 12 months, called Diet Fits. And this study only had two arms. And the two arms were uh, a, a low-carb diet and a high-carb diet. And he was looking at, he wanted to, he knew that what he would see in each group was some people do really well and some really poorly. And he wanted to see if perhaps these genetic markers, he was looking at three different genetic variations. Uh, he wanted to see if they would affect the outcome or if insulin resistance would affect the outcome. Mm -hmm. And very interestingly, none of that predicted who was, who was successful and who was unsuccessful in weight loss. So we're left in this position today where that is largely unanswered. There, for some reason, some people do better on high carb and there's certain people that are doing better on low carb. Mm. And uh, perhaps future research will, will tease out why that is. Uh, but at this stage, you know, I've kind of changed my view a little bit, I, I'd have to say, on, on low carb and I've softened, I think I've softened my approach a bit. If, if that works for someone, then, you know, I think that meeting them where they are is, is the better approach. And that's not to say you can't do a low carb diet in a healthy way. Right, I mean, it's, a, it's what kind of low carb diet, if you're doing a low carb diet that's rife with saturated fat and all these mm. other things that we've been talking about, not so good, but there are ways of doing it in a healthy manner. Yeah, so you can, you know, going back to that theme, the plant predominant theme, you can do a low carb diet within that theme. And instead of loading up on the, the red meats and, and the dairy, you're going to be more emphasizing the, the nuts and the seeds and, and the plant protein. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, you know, I've <laughs> since writing this book and I, uh, I, I'm not sure exactly what communities have been speaking about the book, but I've had a number of people from the low carb community get in contact with me. And what I've uh, realized, Rich, is there are a lot of people in the low carb community who, despite what Paul Saladino and Sean Baker uh, might be saying about cholesterol, there are a lot of people who do believe the science, low carbs working for them, they're losing weight, but they do believe the science when it comes to heart disease and they are fearful. You know, these are uh, young parents, people 40s and 50s who, you know, they, they, they found a way of eating that does help them lose weight. But at the same time, they go to their doctor and their they doctor's like, markers. Yeah. their doctor's like, what are you doing? You know, we need to put you on a statin. And, uh, you know, that's scary. So, what I found is that there are a large number of people who are really receptive to this idea of, you know, hang on, you don't have to uh, abandon this approach that's working for you. You can actually do it in a way that is evidence-based. We can, uh, you know, keep you on this path of weight loss if that's right for you. And at the same time, we can modify the foods that are, that are in that diet in a way that will drive your cholesterol levels down, drive your uh, uh, insulin resistance down, and overall, you know, not just deliver on weight loss, but also put you at lower risk of, of these diseases. And what would some of those cornerstone foods be? So it's, it's all about driving the saturated fat down and increasing polyunsaturated fats. Uh, you're, you're trying to cut back on, on meats and dairy in particular, and you're, you're wanting to increase nuts and seeds and and seafood if you eat seafood um, is a much better source of polyunsaturated fats much lower in saturated fats compared to to meat mm -hmm. um, so those are the main uh, little tweaks but also finding ways uh, within their their diet to increase fiber as well is important uh, and you can do that through in a low carb manner where instead of it being you know leaning heavily on the sort of starchy foods you're really trying to increase the volume of uh sort of low 
low calorie, very nutrient dense vegetables. Right, like super low glycemic vegetables. <laughs> yeah, so yeah. lots of dark cruciferous vegetables and dark leafy grains. Yeah. And and so you you can easily shift this sort of animal heavy low carb diet to a more Mediterranean style low carb diet and you see very quick, you know, huge improvements in their blood lipids, improvements in blood pressure, um, and they feel better. But you personally eat around 50, 30, 20, right? 50% carb, 30% mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> protein, 20% fat. Yeah, if I was to count That's it a lot out, of protein. I think actually somewhere around there, maybe a perhaps a little more fat and a little less protein. Than, than that, mm -hmm. uh, but that would be kind of around around the mark, and that's what leaves me feeling the best. Uh, I'm a I'm I'm big on diet quality being more important than focusing too much on the macronutrients. The macronutrients can get uh, can be important if you have a very specific goal, uh, and and for example, uh, athletes or bodybuilders, etc. But I think uh, what's more important first is the quality of those macronutrients, the quality of the fat, the quality of the carbohydrates. You know, it's less jelly beans, more black beans. Mm -hmm. uh, the quality That's of my the protein. Quote of yours, by the way. Yeah. So, <laughs> uh, you know, where we, there are uh, a lot of people that are very anti carbohydrates, but carbohydrates is a it's an umbrella term and what matters is where you're getting those carbohydrates from mm -hmm. if if they're coming from jelly beans then you're going to run into problems right this idea you know in terms of of kind of falsified narratives out there vilifying all carbohydrates lumping in you know the black beans with the jelly beans is preposterous or analogizing fruit to diet soda mm -hmm. or soda sugar soda mm -hmm. yeah um, we've talked extensively on this podcast about protein, meeting your protein needs on a plant-based diet. So I don't want to belabor the point, but I haven't had you here to do it. And you're, you, you being a very strong physical specimen, um, I think it's worthy if somebody's tuning into this and isn't familiar with either of us, and perhaps this is their first introduction to some of the ideas we're talking about, to at least spend a couple of minutes talking about the big protein question, because it's still, propagates in terms of people who are interested in moving towards a more plant-centric diet, but are fearful of what that implies in terms of meeting their protein needs, mm -hmm. especially for, you know, the active people mm -hmm. amongst that cohort. Yeah, so this uh, was a very uh, large fear of mine <laughs> when I was initially making the changes to my diet. And uh, I always remind myself of that because it's, it's easy to kind of dismiss it and, and, and forget that, uh, you know, the, the sort of general school of thought is that you get your protein from animal foods and that plants are missing protein. Mm -hmm. And uh, to this day, when you go to a restaurant or you go to Chipotle, they say, what's your, which, what protein do you want on mm -hmm. this? And, uh, yeah, very rarely does that, uh, include plant protein. Mm -hmm. Uh, although that's, you know, it's starting to change. I think the food environment's starting to 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 modify, Definitely. And, and and we're seeing you know increases in uh, plant protein options. And I was chatting with Paul Shapiro um, a couple of weeks ago now, and he's doing you know exciting things with yeah, it's myco protein. Wild his, what his company is doing <laughs> right now with mushrooms. Mm. Yeah, it's crazy. You know, feeding my, uh, these fungi microbes, uh, potato and uh, sorghum, and then producing this super protein rich uh, food. I tried some as well and uh, it's incredible. Mm, so yeah, I haven't tried it yet. Um, you know, that's, that's, that's certainly the future of food. Uh, but overall, uh, I think there are a few aspects of protein that are somewhat misunderstood uh, and uh, we can perhaps clear up some of that confusion. Uh, the first would be that plant protein is missing certain essential amino acids. And, uh, you know, protein is made up of amino acids. They're the little uh, building blocks. Um, and uh, our body can make 11 of them. And the other nine are considered essential amino acids. 
we, we have to get them through our food. And uh, the, the idea for many decades has been that plants are missing some of those amino acids. Uh, and you hear this idea of complete protein, right? And, and often, uh, you know, people speak to quinoa and soy. And I think definition here is really important. It's critical to this because I think there's a misunderstanding of what complete protein means. I think most people think, okay, well, if quinoa and soy are complete proteins, that means that these other plants are missing amino acids. They're inferior. Yeah, or that they're just totally missing something. And that's not true. So all plants contain all nine essential amino acids. They're not, they're not missing. There just are some of those plants where certain amino acids are in lower amounts. And so the definition of incomplete actually by definition within the science, although it's not used this way in general uh, conversation, is not that an amino acid is missing. It's just that it is in a, uh, a smaller percentage. And if you were to eat only that food for all of your calories, then you might run into some trouble. You might not consume enough of, of a certain amino acid to meet your body's daily requirement. So you can imagine that that's, that's kind of a useful definition for developing countries, places where there is food security problems. And if someone's living on one or two foods, then that's important. But if you're eating a diet where you have a range of an abundance of food options, then really it's not that helpful. And uh, if you're eating, so if you are eating with uh, diversity, you will, you might be consuming, for example, uh, grains that are low in lysine. And look, it's true. If if you were to eat certain grains and that was providing your 3,000, 2,500 calories, then you might, you might fall short on lysine. Um, and the same could be said about certain beans. If you eat a certain bean for, th for all of your calories, you might fall short on methionine. But beans are very rich in lysine. And when you start adding all these foods into your diet, some might be low in a certain amino acid, but the other food is really high. Right, it's really an academic exercise because almost no one is only eating one food. Correct. Unless you're like the spud fit guy who's eating just mm. potatoes for a year or you, you are in a developing country and there is a, a legitimate food mm. scarcity issue, but almost everybody is eating at least two, three, five, six, seven, ten 10 different foods throughout the course of a day or two. And if you're doing that, you're eating with that diversity and you're eating enough calories, you, you will not run into problems. You will get all of the essential amino acids that your body needs. And anyone can, can run a simple exercise. Don't believe me, download the Chronometer app. It's a free app. Uh, plug in uh, a day of eating and uh, you will quickly see that you will exceed the 100% the recommended amount for all nine essential amino acids. Um, and, and, and you'll see it's very hard not to <laughs> exceed. Mm -hmm. um, it would be more challenging to fall short on them than it would be to consume enough of them. Is there any validity to the argument of high quality versus low mm -hmm. quality proteins? If we're meeting all of our essential amino acid needs, is there a difference in plant protein X versus animal protein Y hmm. beyond just the narrow lens of amino acid intake. I mean, we're, you know, like IGF-1 and all these mm -hmm. other things that come into play in terms of the impact on mm -hmm. our ability to, you know, build and repair our muscles. Mm -hmm. So uh, let's, let's step back uh, one step here. Uh, I think it's important to, acknowledge that if you look at populations who are, who are vegetarian or are vegan um, across the board, whether you're looking at uh, populations in North America or in Europe, uh, people are consuming more than enough total protein. And that's, that's really important. So there's a, a paper just out from Slovenia, Health Conscious Vegans, uh, and these people were consuming about 1.5 grams of protein per kilo Mm -hmm. Right, and the recommendation is to consume uh, 0.83 grams per kilogram 
that's just for everyday functioning, not if you're an athlete. If you're an athlete, it's going to be higher uh, in the realm of 1.2 grams per kilo up to sort of 1.6 grams per kilo. Uh, but first and foremost, these populations of people eating only plants or almost only plants uh, are getting more than enough total protein. And then the question is around protein quality and often people wonder, well, is there a difference in bioavailability as well? Um, and you hear about animal protein being much more superior in terms of absorption and your body's ability to utilize it. And, uh, you know, of course, the, the, the RDA and when they did the guidelines, they had to consider this because if there was a really, really big difference, they would need separate guidelines you know, 0.83 grams per kilo would not be for everyone. It would be for omnivores. Mm -hmm. And then for vegetarians and vegans, there would need to be a separate guideline. Right. If there was a percent, a 20% reduction in bioavailability, bioavailability of plant protein, then you would have to increase mm -hmm. that up from 0.83. Yeah, which there's not. And that's based on nitrogen balance studies, which essentially can look at uh, the, you know, how well your body is absorbing protein. Uh, and, and these studies have been able to compare animal protein versus plant protein uh, and, and see that there is not a big enough difference to justify different recommendations for protein requirements for different populations, mm -hmm. omnivores, vegetarians, vegans. Um, now, I will say that there, there have been some studies where uh, animal protein has uh, l been made to look quite superior to plant protein. And uh, there, there are a few problems with this, this research or limitations, I should say. There, there's, there's not a problem with the studies themselves, um, but limitations in terms of how we can interpret them. Uh, a lot of this knowledge early on was built on animal studies feeding them different proteins and, and measuring absorption. Uh, and, and so the physiology is different to, to us, but they can act as a useful model, particularly pigs, which have a, a closer digestive system to us compared to rats. Um, but one of the biggest problems with this research is that by and large across the board, when it came to plant protein, they fed them raw plant protein. And we know that cooking beans and grains, for example, mm -hmm. it helps make the nutrients more bioavailable. And you know, you and I wouldn't eat a raw bean right. for that reason. Um, and so what's happened is in those studies, the, the, the results sort of overstate the differences between the animal protein and the plant protein. Um, now, in more recent years, there are now human studies that have looked at properly prepared plant proteins. And in the plant proteins that they've looked at, there seems to be only a few percent difference in bioavailability. And there's a paper by Mary Otti uh, from 2019 that summarizes all of that. And so the, the current position is that, you know, there might be a slightly uh, lower bioavailability of plant protein, but it's much less than, than what mm. had been thought in the past. And I'll add the caveat there that there is probably only around six or seven plant proteins that have been tested. So I'd love to see more research and look at, you know, hundreds of different sources of plant protein. Sure. Um, but it, it, it does seem like there's, there's not a significant difference or, or at this stage reason to be worried mm. about bioavailability differences. And, um, but perhaps more important than any of this, because let's be honest, people listening and you and I, uh, bioavailability and percentages around absorption, that's not what matters. What matters is what happens in what happens to various health outcomes or uh, short-term outcomes in terms of strength and building muscle. Mm -hmm. And I spoke before to the clear benefits of swapping animal protein for plant protein when it comes to our long-term health. You know, that there's, there's, there's no doubt about that. It's absolutely consistent in the literature. In terms of strength and uh, building muscle, this is a really interesting 
uh, area. And there's a lot of emerging science here. And I'm starting to see nutrition scientists in this space who uh, have been very adamant that animal protein is king, starting to change their their tune a bit. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, you know, I don't think it's all, all sort of said and done, um, but there is some early clues uh, that you can still get the same benefits in terms of strength and hypertrophy from consuming plant protein. Um, and we need more research looking at different populations. But there's one study uh, that came out early this year, actually. And this was a, a randomized controlled trial and really the first of its kind. A lot of studies in the past, Rich, that have looked at at plant protein and, and looking at resistance training and uh, measuring strength and hypertrophy have looked at the addition of, say, a soy protein shake to an omnivorous diet mm-hmm. and, and versus uh, another group who are eating an omnivorous diet with a whey protein shake. So it's, it's very hard to, from, from that study, sort of extrapolate to a completely plant exclusive diet because their baseline diet was including animal They were foods. already meeting their protein needs. Yeah, and they were, they were not a, uh, uh, a person consuming a vegan diet. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's, it's, it's just a different question, right? Uh, those studies are essentially just comparing uh, whey versus soy protein in the context of the two different people eating the same diet. Right, I got it. Whereas with the this latest study, it was okay. Uh, let's actually look at at healthy adult males who are consuming a completely plant based diet, same sort of diet you and I would consume, uh, with a, a soy protein um, shake supplement against a group consuming an omnivorous diet with a whey protein supplement. Mm-hmm. So now we have completely plant against an omnivorous diet, how most people in the sort of uh, resistance training uh, industry would eat. Uh, and we get to to see, is there a difference in strength and, uh, and in terms of hypertrophy, lean muscle? Uh, and I should note, these were... These were healthy adults that were active, but they weren't, uh, they weren't people that had been doing resistance training for years. And there was a very important reason for that selection. Once you've been training for a very long time, it's, it's hard to, to yeah, build plateau, muscle. You plateau. Right. So you're likely in a, in a 12-week trial, uh, you're, you're, you're not likely to see enough differences <laughs> to yeah. be able to measure uh, whether one diet is superior to the other. So what they wanted is almost these healthy, fit people who are going to get those early newbie gains mm-hmm. um, and, and see like in this period of rapid growth, is there a difference between these different diets? Uh, so they, they brought these folks in. Uh, they, they did, I think it was 10 or 12 weeks of resistance training. This is a study out of Brazil. Uh, Hamilton Rochelle is the lead research, lead, uh, researcher. And they, what they found was there was no significant difference at all in strength or hypertrophy. Mm. And both groups had great improvements in both. Uh, so look, what can we say from that study? Well, we can say in, in healthy adult males, uh, that did not have a history of resistance training, there seems to be no difference in terms of whether it's plant protein or animal protein. Yeah, no difference in terms of your ability to make gains Mm -hmm. in a certain period of time. That's right. And, uh, you know, is that the same for an elderly population? Who, who, as you you get older, you develop anabolic resistance and and so your, um, your ability to generate muscle to, to, uh, promote lean muscle growth is harder. Um, that, you know, there are certain ideas out there, for example, that animal proteins might be better in that population because of differences in amino acids, particularly being uh, more concentrated in leucine. But these were the same ideas that were held not too long ago about healthy adult males. Mm -hmm. And what we're starting to see here and I didn't mention this about that study, they set both groups at 1.6 grams per kilogram of protein intake. That seems to be 
the sort of threshold. If you want to absolutely maximize muscle protein synthesis, that's the level you need to hit. Mm -hmm. Once you go above that, you don't really see any extra uh, improvement. Um, so, you know, that's that's kind of where science is up to today. Yeah, the current state of affairs. I mean, that's that's encouraging. And I would like to see that study with elderly people as well, because I have heard that, like once you reach mm. a certain age where your body becomes, you know, less able to um, hold on to that muscle mass mm. and, and make those gains, that protein then becomes a much more Im important, you know, component of yeah. your diet. And that's coming, those researchers mm -hmm. are going to do it. Uh, but you know, having spoken to the researchers, and I think they were a bit surprised by the results of that study. Uh, you know, I'm not so sure they're they're as confident going in to to studying the elderly now uh, in terms of animal protein being vastly superior, because in this study of of healthy uh, young adult males, even though the protein was matched at 1.6 grams per kilo and they, they had no differences in strength or in lean muscle, the plant-based protein group did consume significantly less leucine, mm. right? So, mm. so they, they were still able to achieve the same health outcomes despite the lower concentration of leucine um, in their diet. And I think that's an, that's an important thing right, to so consider. What, is it, what does that tell you? What do you extrapolate from that? Well, I extrapolate that uh, there might've been there may be a, an overemphasis on the the importance of focusing in, dialing in to leucine. Uh, I think it's no doubt is important, but but most important is total protein. And if you're hitting that 1.6 grams per kilogram mark, uh, I don't think there is added benefit of just continuing to dial up leucine. Um, right you know, further and further. And in fact, if you speak to longevity scientists, <laughs> likes of Volta Longo, sure. that these guys are gonna <clears throat> say, you know, one of the inherent benefits of plant protein is that it's exposing you to lower amounts of leucine and methionine, these uh, amino acids that are thought to activate, uh, you know, not just muscle growth pathways, but also aging pathways. It's so interesting. It's also fascinating to see traditional kind of gym rat bodybuilder type guys pivoting towards plant-based uh, you know protein powders instead of the traditional mm -hmm. way like they're not these are not plant-based people they're not vegan people they're probably eating their chicken and their broccoli mm -hmm. and doing the standard routine yet they're still going to the pea and the brown rice and the you know various new products that are coming mm -hmm. on board as opposed to just doing the way thing like mm -hmm. traditionally they always have. Yeah, and some of that is is probably down to the way that whey makes certain mm -hmm. people feel. Yeah, and there's a lot of lactose intolerance out there. Um, so, uh, you know, it's 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 nice to see that change in the community, and and uh, I think this study in particular is giving people more and more confidence, right? Because people need the data. Um, you know, there are a lot of great anecdotes out there and you can see a lot of people like yourself um, who have had very, very successful careers in uh, various forms of, of performance, the performance world, be it endurance or be it resistance training. But now to have some, some actual data uh, is is giving people more confidence to lean into this yeah. um, and explore it a bit further. Yeah. So Simon, I want to switch gears and cover Simon, some other terrain, but before we move off of human health, um, perhaps some final thoughts on LDL and the carnivore diet, because there's a lot of people out there who are being influenced by certain quote unquote influencers with respect to this meat heals perspective of, 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 of diet and nutrition. So let's just kind of put this to bed. Yeah, so I am extremely concerned. I, I, I think would be a nice way of summarizing, uh, you know, s what we're seeing with people adopting the all meat diets. Uh, you know, certainly, and, and I mentioned before that a number of people in low carb community have reached out to me. Uh, and some of these have been people that have been eating a completely carnivorous diet. And it cannot be denied that you can get good short-term 
results. Mm -hmm. Especially if you're moving off of a standard American diet, you are going to mm -hmm. experience, you know, some pretty immediate changes in how you feel. Right. And, and, you know, speaking back to that Stanford study and the microbiome, you know, it's, it's not sort of far fetched to, to, uh, to understand that perhaps there is uh, a certain amount of microbiome disruption where the addition of plant foods is uncomfortable for people. And a, car a carnivore diet is essentially, it's a strict elimination diet. Mm -hmm. And so if, you, if, if, if these people, even if they're trying to eat healthfully, are introducing certain plant foods and it's revving up their inflammation uh, and making- Especially, yeah, sorry to interrupt, but you're, you've, if you've been eating strictly carni carnivorously, you're seeding your microbiome with a certain type of, mm. of microbiota, right? That feed on mm -hmm. that type of food and you're lacking the diversity to be able to, um, to create a healthy environment for the plant microbiomes to propagate. Mm -hmm. And that you'll, you'll have digestive issues, you'll have inflammation and all the like. Yeah, so you, you know, I see it as a bit of a Band-Aid. Uh, if, if someone is in a state of chronic inflammation and uh, their gut is very inflamed, Removing a lot of foods does work. We see it, you know, the low FODMAP diet, for example, which is a specific diet for people with IBS. Uh, you're removing the triggers. Now, the problem is the, the food that you're removing is not unhealthy. It's just that your microbiome is not set up in a way that allows you to derive the benefits of that food. Mm -hmm. uh, so completely removing those foods from your diet and doing something like adopting a, a carnivorous diet, it could in the short term make someone feel a bit better. Uh, the problem is because you're removing all of this prebiotic substrate, you're starving those bacteria. So you're going to, as you say, over time, you know, lose more and more diversity uh, and you're not getting all of those benefits that we spoke about before with regards to uh, the production of these short chain fatty acids, these postbiotics that then, you know, keep the, the, the gut lining intact and, and, and provide huge benefits both locally in the gut and also downstream. You know, these, these, these metabolites are lowering the risk of colorectal cancer. Mm -hmm. um, they're driving down inflammation throughout the body um, and, you know, protecting us against things like neurodegenerative diseases. So there's a, there's a Band-Aid solution here where you get this short-term benefit. What I think is being overlooked is that chronic diseases have a long latency period. You know, they bubble away mm -hmm. under the surface for for a while and uh you know you might experience chronic disease in your 40s or 50s or 60s but by and large the lifestyle that you were leading 10 20 30 years ago was has has had a lot to do with the development of that chronic disease you know you spoke to the soldiers from the korean war mm -hmm. they were young they were laying down the the pathology of atherosclerosis um, so my fear is it is this sort of short-term Band-Aid solution. And my biggest fear with it is that it sends LDL cholesterol through the roof. I'm talking, I said before, 100 milligrams per deciliter is like, it's considered the kind of recommendation, you know, here in, in America and in Australia. But as I said, really, you got to get down to 60 or 70 milligrams per deciliter where you don't see atherosclerosis. Uh, and here's the really, really uh, interesting thing, Rich. Um, Lauren Cordain, he wrote the Paleo Diet book. He also published a, a paper that goes into uh, what, is, what is a healthy LDL cholesterol level. This is coming from the father of the Paleo Diet. And he, he went through and he looked at LDL cholesterols of primates and of... Uh, hunter-gatherer tribes where there is low uh, incidence of, of atherosclerosis. And his conclusion in this paper that he wrote, the father of the paleo diet, was that human LDL cholesterol needs to be at 50 to 70 milligrams per deciliter in order to avoid atherosclerosis. So this is coming from him. Mm -hmm. And you might think, well, hang on, 
he's advocating for the paleo diet, then how can he be also saying that LDL cholesterol should be low? And a lot of this comes back down to what the paleo diet is versus how people are doing it. Yeah. And, and That's so- That's a very good point. Yeah, yeah. because for, yeah, it's, it's, it's not exactly the way that it's been massively adopted. That's right. And the paleo diet, if you look how, uh, at how Lauren Cordain, uh, what he recommends, uh, you know, it, it's, it's talking about meats that are very low in saturated fat. If you went back and looked in the Paleolithic era and you look at woolly mammoth or, you know, these types of meats that would have been eaten then, um, they're more equivalent to venison and antelope, which are very low in saturated fat and higher in polyunsaturated fats. Um, that's actually ironic in itself because <laughs> those people that are, that are blaming uh, polyunsaturated fats in seed oils are overlooking the fact that meat from the Paleolithic era was very rich in polyunsaturated fats. Um, but overall, uh, Lauren Cordain, his his recommendations is for a, a diet that's that's low in saturated fat. Even though he 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 speaks about the inclusion of animal foods, he he talks about that being more consistent with the type, the quality of meat that people were eating back then, and he talks about the importance of a very high fiber diet. Uh, in fact, he mentions that many of these people were eating over a hundred grams of fiber a day. Um, so, I think that's that's very uh, important for people to understand that the paleo diet was was not developed as this high saturated fat, uh, animal rich diet. Yeah, but the carnivore diet is something altogether different. It has its roots in this kind of ancestral ideology, mm -hmm. I suppose, um, but part and parcel of the philosophy of the carnivore diet, is it not, is that, um, Saturated fat is your friend. We talked mm -hmm. about that. But also these high LDL markers are something that you should not concern mm -hmm. yourself with. Like, cause you see a lot of that cause people are having mm -hmm. these eleva elevated numbers, including Sean mm -hmm. Baker who shared it on Rogan, et cetera. And, and in response, they just say, well, that high number isn't relevant in the traditional way that we've considered it in the past because I'm doing my diet in this way it's somehow uh, buffered or ameliorated mm -hmm. by dint of the fact that I'm only eating meat. So mm -hmm. help me understand, at least like if, if, if you were them, like how you would articulate that mm -hmm. and then let's kind of deconstruct it. So I mentioned before that saturated fat, increasing LDL cholesterol, increasing risk of uh, atherosclerosis and coronary heart disease is, is the most substantiated relationship in, in science, in nutrition science today, without a doubt. Um, and uh, so much so that in 2017, a cardiologist by the name of Brian Ferentz, he uh, co-authored a paper which uh, very clearly states that LDL is causal in the uh, progression, the development and progression of atherosclerosis. There are some very interesting things in that paper that he walks through, and let's quickly go through those. Uh, you know, there is uh, some some genetic mutations that see people uh, uh, with genetically high LDL cholesterol, um, heterozygous uh, familial hypercholesterolemia, and homozygous, uh, and uh, Hetero, if you inherit one of those genes from one parent and homo, if you inherit both. Um, the latter, unfortunately, leading to much more rapid development of disease. But if you have um, FH, as it's called, in short, then particularly if it's the homozygous form, you know, if you're dealt that genetic card and you have high LDL cholesterol from birth, you know, these are people that have LDL cholesterol between 500 and 1,000, mm. right? Which is where we're seeing people in the carnivore community. If you are- Just literally, you know, five to 10 to mm -hmm. 15 times higher. I think Paul Saladino's is 700. 700, where Cordain's saying- 50, 50 to, to 70, 70. Right? And, uh, these, you know, people that inherit inherit this, if they're not treated with statins, it's very, very common for them to develop cardiovascular disease in their teenage years and die in their twenties or thirties, right? Um, 
and that's obviously very very sad today with the progression of of statins you know these people are living much longer mm-hmm. um so that's that's a first thing that i think is is interesting uh the second is that there there is a type of science we didn't discuss it before called mendelian randomization and this is science that really has uh has become uh i guess popular or more commonly used in the last five to ten years and thanks to uh improvements in our understanding of genetics and Mendelian in the Gregor Mendel sense. I'm, I'm you know not Gregor sure. Mendel? I'm not sure of the origin. He's like the original guy doing plant hybrids and working, yeah. working in genetics. Well, it, it could well be. Um, I'm not sure of the origin, but what it speaks to is these studies are like nature's randomized controlled trial. Uh, there are over 50 genetic mutations which lower LDL cholesterol. Right? If and if you're um, dealt that card and you have lower LDL cholesterol, you have significantly lower risk of developing coronary heart disease mm. through your life. And because this is occurring, uh, you know, uh, as you're being made by your mother, um, you know, it is nature's randomized controlled trial. And so we can see uh, very clearly, what's really interesting about this is that these, um, uh, single nucleotide polymorphisms is what they're called, right? There's 50 of these or more. Is that uh, they all lower LDL cholesterol by different amounts, right? But um, if you are to standardize how much they lower LDL by, right, they all have the same uh, order of effect on coronary heart disease, which means that it's very, you know, it's highly likely that this is. a a causal link, right? We're talking about um, true cause and effect. Between elevated LDL and atherosclerosis. Yes, and it's a linear um, relationship. The lower you get LDL cholesterol down based on whichever genetic variant someone has, the lower their risk of coronary heart disease. Now, um, to add more... uh, evidence onto that, then we have lots and lots of statin trials. And uh, there's there's some anti-statin rhetoric out there, but it is, you know, it's 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 so clear in these studies that when you get when you lower LDL cholesterol through the use of either a statin, uh, azetamibe, or uh, PCSK9 inhibitors. These are different drugs are, are running on, um, acting on different pathways that all lower LDL cholesterol. No matter which one you look at, they all significantly lower coronary heart disease. And once you get someone's LDL cholesterol down to about 70 milligrams per deciliter, which is 1.8 millimoles per liter, with statins or with PCSK9 inhibitors, that's where you stop. You see that the the progression of atherosclerosis stops, and you can start to see some regression. So we have uh, we have evidence from people who have genetically high LDL cholesterol. These people, if they're untreated, will develop um, atherosclerosis in their teens. Uh, we have evidence from people who have genetically low LDL. They're significantly protected against heart disease. We have these statin trials, which you see uh, as a lower LDL cholesterol, you drive coronary heart disease risk down. And then on top of that, we have all of the observational research. You know, there's a meta-analysis, um, the prospective studies collaboration that included 50 plus studies, 12 million plus person years follow up in that study. And it clearly shows in these cohort populations, lower LDL cholesterol, lower risk of coronary heart disease. So when Paul Saladino with his insanely high LDL says, don't sweat it, don't worry Mm -hmm. about it. You don't need to um, concern yourself with this. How is he scientifically substantiating that? I don't think he is. I I think that uh, it's, you know, it's, it's inconvenient for him uh, that LDL is has been shown to be causal in the development of heart disease. And 
I've never seen him be able to to substantiate that, other than the fact he will say that his coronary artery calcium score is zero, mm-hmm. right? But we know that people with a coronary artery calcium score of zero can still have atherosclerosis and can still suffer from a heart attack. So uh, for me, you know, the evidence is overwhelming. The lower your LDL cholesterol and the, the, the more years you're exposed to that low level of LDL cholesterol, the better. Mm-hmm. Enough said on that. Um, I, w- I want to switch gears and, and explore a couple other things we, we've been going on for a while here. Um, obviously, there are different motivations and on ramps for people who are interested in in the plant based diet or becoming more plant predominant in their lifestyle. We've explored the human health piece quite extensively today, but of course, there are <clears throat> other motivators. The ethics of it of our food choices and how that implicates planetary health more largely, which of course uh, also um, brings up the issue of of the environment and the health implications planetarily for the choices that we're making about the foods that we eat and the food products that we choose to um, purchase with our buying power. So let's talk a little bit about that. maybe start more broadly with the idea of of how these dietary choices are affecting like we're in it we're in a climate mm. crisis right now we we all it's incumbent upon all of us to take greater responsibility for the choices that we make daily how does the plant-based diet figure into this equation of being more ecologically responsible well we've turned this place into a giant farm and that's my second favorite quote of yours, by the way. <laughs> and uh, that's, you know, had huge uh, effects on greenhouse gas emissions. Currently, agriculture is responsible for 25% of the world's greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, it's had huge effects on biodiversity loss and deforestation. Agriculture is the number one cause of deforestation throughout the world and uh you know with that we're losing these precious uh you know parts of the natural world that really are our ally in fighting climate change um and uh it's the single greatest uh user of fresh water um you know agriculture is is uh resulting in ocean acidification it's resulting in the uh, eutrophication and hypoxic conditions in certain bodies of water that result in the algal blooms. Um, And, uh, you know, overall, if you are to to look at uh, agriculture, I think one of the most powerful statistics is 50% of the habitable land on earth is used today for agriculture. And of that, 83% of that is used for animal agriculture, yet it only returns us with 18% of our calories Mm -hmm. and is responsible for two thirds of agriculture related emissions. Yeah, so purely from an academic perspective, this is a highly inefficient farm that we're running if the planet is indeed a farm. So we have kind of, uh, I guess, uh, two parts to this. The, the factory farming of animals is very inefficient because it requires large amounts of land to grow crops. And uh, the feed conversion ratio is not great. Like to, to, produce and, and to produce animal products, you have to grow these animals. Mm-hmm. And the larger the animal, the higher the, the basal metabolic rate. You know, it's the energy that that animal's burning just to be alive. Uh, and so with that, what happens is we lose a lot of the calories that we feed in to right. the system. So to ex- if you use like a combustion engine as an analogy, you put gasoline in and not all of that energy gets converted into forward motion of the car. Some of it is cast off by heat, et cetera. Mm-hmm. Um, similarly, when we're taking all of these crops, we're feeding them to animals not all of that is converted into potential energy that's consumed by humans. A lot of it is lost. Like it's just, 
highly high, if you were an alien who came to earth and, and said, show me how you make your food. And we showed them, mm. they would say, this is total insanity. And you know, food waste is important, right? And 17% of the world's calories are wasted. And, and we, we absolutely have to focus on that because that, that's calories that could be ending up in bellies. And it's also uh, a big contributor to greenhouse gas emissions. But what's overlooked is that the, the biggest area of food waste is within animal agriculture. Mm-hmm. It's the waste of the calories that we're feeding into this inefficient system. Mm-hmm. Uh, and to give uh, you an idea of, of the efficiency or lack of efficiency, if you feed a uh, hundred calories into a cow, you'll get 40 calories of milk out the other side. So you'll lose 60%. If you feed uh, 100 calories into uh, a chicken, you'll get 20 calories of eggs out the other side. So you're losing 80%. If you feed 100 calories into a uh, pig or a chicken, you'll get about 10 calories of meat out the other side. So in that example, you can think, you know, if you had... Uh, uh, for one chicken burger, right? You could essentially make 10 black bean burgers. Mm -hmm. You know, that's, that's the difference we're talking about here in terms of, uh, you know, efficiency and what we're wasting. Uh, and then beef, red meat is the, the least efficient of all. You feed a hundred calories into a cow and you get three calories of meat out the other side. Now, often when when I speak to this, people say, well, I only eat the, the grass fed beef and you know, that's, that, they're not feeding them feed crops, they're out grazing. Um, and that's true, but the, the biggest problem with grazing is the amount of land <laughs> that, yeah. that it's using. And uh, you know, in order to, um, to make space for that industry, which provides very few calories, we have to clear a lot of land. Uh, and there's um, a really interesting paper from 2018, Tim Searchinger, uh, that, that has gone back and looked at today's grasslands and at least 41% of them were forests or woody savanna not too long ago. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, globally right now, um, you know, that still to this day, the number one cause of deforestation is animal agriculture. Right. So, you know, I could do a four hour podcast on the environmental implications of animal agriculture and and the impact of a pivot to a plant centric diet in terms of the ecological impact. Um, We don't have four hours. So I wanna focus our remaining time on uh, the conversation around regenerative agriculture, um, because I think there's a lot of confusion here. Um, I've hosted, people from this arena on the podcast. We're both friends with Rylan Englehart, who's behind the Kiss the Ground movement and the Cafe Gratitude restaurants. I've had John and Molly Chester from Biggest Little Farm on here. I have a lot of respect for people who have devoted their time and energy towards the regeneration of our soils, because I think this is crucial. It's a crucial piece in redressing climate change and pivoting from a consumptive society into a regenerative one. But I also think there's a lot of misunderstanding, as I said, and also um, greenwashing when it comes to how we're understanding what exactly it is that we're talking about with respect Mm -hmm. to regenerative agriculture. I think there's a lot of well-intentioned, but perhaps misconceived narratives about this. So I wanna parse truth from fiction when it comes to what we're talking about with regen ag um, what exactly can be accomplished, what is getting overlooked and what these, what the kind of inherent flaws are when it comes to the claims being made by the holistic land management uh, mm-hmm. cohort of advocates. Gosh, big question. Uh, so, you know, I am a, a huge proponent of regenerative agriculture overall. I think it makes a lot of sense. I, I think that, we certainly need to consider soil health. Uh, I, I think uh, definitions are important here and also uh, looking at what the science says because it is an area like the diet wars where uh, emotion can, can affect 
uh, the interpretation of of science and um, so I think there's a little bit of of science to go through here as well um, regarding definitions you know regenerative agriculture uh, is really nothing new you know a lot of the practices be it polycropping or intercropping uh, you know or uh, cover cropping. These are those are ancestral these practices. Are first, What's new is industrialized farming. That's right, and and so a lot of you know regenerative agriculture. I guess in some ways it's it's become a bit of a buzzword, but I do think it's important for people to understand the roots of many of these practices are from uh, First Nations uh, land management and uh, regenerative agriculture uh, overall. Is, is not the same as regenerative beef. Regenerative beef is one practice, this holistic grazing within a whole plethora of regenerative mm -hmm. agricultural practices. And, and so uh, there have been, you know, many, many uh, First Nations people around the world that have uh, improved uh, soil without animal integration using polycropping, cover cropping, green manure, et cetera. Um, so I think that's an important point because I think sometimes when people think of a regenerative agriculture, they immediately think of regenerative grazing. Mm -hmm. I don't think that there's much debate at all about polycropping and intercropping and cover cropping. I think that's generally accepted across the board that those practices are much better for promoting biodiversity and improving soil health. I think and, where- And sequestration. And sequestration, sequestration, right? I think where there is dispute is around regenerative grazing. And uh, I, I believe, and I've had a number of people on my show uh, to talk about this as well from yeah. both sides. Right. I should point out, uh, so I don't forget, you've done a number of podcasts with Nicholas Carter and mm -hmm. those are, I don't know, three or four with him. I yeah. mean, those are fantastic. So we're not gonna be able to get into, you know, the super nitty gritty mm -hmm. of all this, but everybody should go listen to um, Simon's conversations with, with Nicholas on his Plant Proof podcast because it's mm. very- You should have him on. He's, yeah, I would love he's to have him uh, on. an incredible environmental uh, researcher, scientist. Um, but I guess, you know, big claims require big evidence. <laughs> and the, you know, the, there have been some wild claims made about regenerative grazing over the years. Alan Savory, most notably, uh, you know, he's, he's well known for uh, a YouTube TED talk. Mm -hmm. And he said this that was really the key. kicked off this whole thing. He said this was the key to reversing climate change, you know, and his idea is that he believes through his practices that you can sequester an enormous amount of carbon, right? And that would be amazing. You imagine we could draw down, you know, all of this carbon that is, you know, that has been emitted since the industrial revolution, get it into our soils and cool the planet. That's a, that, that is a, a great story. Now, where does the science lie? That's, that's ultimately what we should be most concerned with. Um, and the, the science doesn't stack up with it, with these practices being a net carbon sequestering practice. So it's true that you can sequester some carbon. Absolutely. Um, the problem is that when you are, 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 are accounting for methane emissions and nitrous oxide from the animals, the, the, net, of, the net position is one of greenhouse gas emissions. And there was a big report done from out of Oxford University um, called Grazed and Confused by mm -hmm. Dr. Tara Garnett. And she, she walks through this, the fact that, you know, you can probably offset about 40 to 60% of emissions. Um, but even then over time, what happens is the soil becomes saturated with carbon. And so over, over, over the years, you're sequestering less and less carbon, but you still have the same amount of methane and nitrous oxide emissions. So the practice is becoming less net sequestering over time. Right, the, 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 the livestock themselves being the emitters. Mm -hmm. um, but also part of that report, was it not this idea that 
the sequestration is not indefinite, but mm -hmm. time sensitive in right. that it, it, it's not permanently sequestered in the soil. That's right. So it can be uh, reversible. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, uh, still to this day, and it is uh, somewhat frustrating, you know, I, I actually, I think that, that some uh, regenerative grazing, like let's say we were moving to a world where uh, you, everyone was adopting very plant predominant diets and the only uh, beef production was regenerative grazing. I think that's a great result sure. for the world. Sure. Um, but what I've noticed is from this this industry, there, there doesn't seem to be a message about reduction. Mm -hmm. It seems to be a message about uh, it's not the cow, it's the how. And that's, that's a it's a nice message to the mainstream who perhaps don't want to change their, their meat consumption. Uh, they don't have to, they can just change, you know, where yeah. it's come from. There's a, there's an intellectual dishonesty with advocating for a solution premised on more grazing without the counterpoint or not the counterpart being, this is all contingent upon everybody moving to a more mm. plant predominant diet because by dint of sheer land availability, this model cannot scale to meet global meat mm -hmm. demand as it currently stands. You're correct in that if everybody pivoted to only eating beef that was grass fed and grazed on regenerative land such as this, we would be in a much better state, but it's a mathematical Im mm -hmm. impossibility to meet global meat demand using this model. So something has to change. And as much as I admire the people behind Kiss the Ground and what they're 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 trying to communicate. I think there's a lot of good in that movie. Mm -hmm. I feel like it overlooked or gave short shrift to a very important point, which is that no matter what, no matter how efficacious this model is, it will still all demand that we reduce our meat consumption. Mm -hmm. And the the key point being here. Why do we need to reduce our meat consumption? Because we need to free up land. We need to produce more calories from less land and, and restore vast amounts of land back to wild ecosystems. Right, and those wild ecosystems, forests, et cetera, are actually better at sequestering mm -hmm. carbon than a you know, grazed regenerative farm would be. Yeah, so, uh, you know, this, this is a really uh, interesting point too, because there is this sort of prevailing idea, I guess, f um, from people within holistic grazing that you need the animals to regenerate the land. And that's, that's not true. There, there is a meta-analysis uh, 2020, which, look, which specifically looked at what happens to biodiversity when you include livestock versus excluding them. Uh, and they specifically showed that when you exclude uh, livestock from land, you get greater returns in biodiversity, increased numbers of herbivores, you restore the predator-prey relationship, you increase the number of intervertebrate pollinators. Um, so the why I, I believe that the, the solution to this, Rich, is that until there's an incentive for the landowner Mm -hmm. to practice conservation. Like let's think about regeneration and, and just drop agriculture off the end of it for a moment. I understand that, you know, farmers and landowners need to make an income. And I think the grazing aspect is, uh, is, is a result of economics. And well, it's a, it's a result of incentives or mis a misalignment of incentives. And in New Zealand, uh, they, they have a, an incentive to uh, afforestation, so converting um, grasslands into forests. And it's now got to a point, so 2020 paper that just, uh, or 2021, um, it's now got to a point where landowners, uh, it, it, the, the more economical choice is to practice tree planting and afforestation than uh, livestock grazing. Mm, how did they create that incentive structure? Well, they are valuing carbon drawdown and biodiversity. And so uh, I think that this is, this is sort of critical to solving this is uh, our mindset. 
you know, if you if you go back to the First Nations people, you know, something that that we can learn from from that their culture is living in harmony with the environment, being stewards uh, of the environment, uh, being guardians of the environment, and. Uh, it's a different approach to looking at land and thinking about uh, what value can I extract from that in the form of calories. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, the New Zealand government, what they have done is they have placed value on the carbon, on carbon uh, storage. And so, you know, you, you, you create a situation where the owner of that land stands to make more money um, by, by practicing carbon farming as, as, a, as opposed to uh, livestock grazing. Mm. Yeah, we need some fundamental changes from the top down here as well as from the bottom up. Um, the farm bill being one of them. I know Ryland's very active in doing some advocacy around the next vote that's taking place, I think next year. Um, and we do need a better incentive structure because these farmers are well-intentioned and they just wanna make a living mm -hmm. and they're just trying to get by. So mm -hmm. how can we create a system that drives them towards making that regenerative choice in a way that's restoring our land, protecting mm -hmm. our soils and, you know, promoting the, the increase in, in biodiversity. You know, it, 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 it always goes back to that analogy with the microbiome. Like mm -hmm. these are all microsystems and macrosystems that mimic each other in terms of how uh, health outcomes are produced. Mm -hmm. And it starts, you know, at the, at the very micro level and scales up from there. There's a, uh, a wonderful documentary called Rewilding a Mountain. You heard of Heart Mountain? It's oh, in is Oregon. The, is this in China? There was, yeah. there was, they did something similar in China yeah. too. You know what I'm yeah, talking about? Yeah, I believe about, they did. The, but this is different. This is in Oregon, I believe. Uh, Heart Mountain, and uh, it's a it's a documentary that looked at a uh, 20 year rewilding project. Uh, the land manager at the time consulted scientists, and they said to him, "You have to remove livestock." And you know all the riparian areas were completely damaged. The 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 birds had left. Uh, the the land was very degraded. Um, you know a lot of degraded land around the world today is through overgrazing. And uh, you know this documentary steps through what happened, uh, and you see the pronghorn antelope come back, and that predator prey relationship comes back, and you see the the grasslands grow, and it's not just this kind of mono grassland, but it's native grasslands that you know, and that's that's an important point. Native grasslands are actually different to a lot of these grazing grasslands. Um, they support a, a, a very diverse range of herbivores. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's a, that's a nice, I think, documentary for, for people to, to watch if they want to see what happens when you exclude livestock from the land. Um, and this is, this is just critical to us solving the, the, the climate change problem uh, in terms of agriculture is rewilding a lot of land uh, and and producing more calories from from less land and you know sometimes I hear of this idea of marginal land I'm not sure if you've heard of that mm. um, and the the idea with marginal land is that uh, you know this land um, you can't do anything with it except for graze cattle on it um, but that's not true that's, that's if you're looking at it from an extraction of calories lens. There's nothing marginal about that land to the animals and the ecosystem should you regenerate mm -hmm. it. And- Yeah, marginal, is, that's a subjective assessment, you know, only yeah. by, by virtue of how valuable it is mm -hmm. to us. So I think if we can, uh, you know, change that, that mindset and from a less kind of uh, dominating mindset and, and uh, more to practicing conservation and get the incentives in like New Zealand, this is happening now around the world, uh, then, uh, you know, farmers can be a key, key, key part, play a key role in, in helping to heal the planet. Mm -hmm. And imagine, uh, I would imagine that, you know, if you can create that sort of structure for these farmers, just how much more 
um, fulfilled and purpose driven mm. they would feel as stewards of the land mm. rather than as extractors. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I think we've gone we've gone over three hours today, <laughs> dude. <laughs> we could go another so much more three. To say. I my outline, I think we did two things on my entire outline. Um, but I'm not letting you go without without congratulating you on the new book. This really is like the ultimate primer, just chock a block with accessible tools that walk you through everything that we talked about today and so much more with respect to how to be more plant predominant um, and understanding, you know, all the hows and whys behind it. I know years of your life went into this. When I was in Australia that mm. January, you were writing it then and that seems like a past life. <laughs> so <laughs> You gave me some great tips actually. It's, uh, <laughs> it's finally reached uh, North American shores. It's coming out September 30, what's the date? November 1st. November 1st, got it. We've calendared this to go out right around the same time. Um, so kudos on that. Everybody should check out um, Simon's podcast, Plant Proof. And beyond that, uh, plantproof.com is an incredible resource with tons of articles that are freely available where you can kind of learn the nuts and bolts of how to do this properly. And everything I might add is, um, or nothing I, I should add about Plant Proof or this book is being monetized by you, basically. This is stuff that you make freely available and the proceeds of the book are being directed to charity, am I correct? Yeah, maybe we should finish this on yeah. a nice optimistic. Yeah. Uh, I got some good news last night. What's that? Uh, the the Daintree rainforest in Australia, which is has been, you know, threatened uh, threatened uh, through deforestation over a number of years. It's the world's oldest tropical rainforest, one of the most biodiverse places on earth, and it's a world heritage site now. Um, and overnight, uh, there was a um, an agreement made between the government and the First Nations people that that are from that area, um, and uh, they have been uh, granted the land to be the custodians of the land. So it's mm -hmm. going to be handed back to them to be under their care. The uh, Kuku Yalanji people, Eastern Kuku Yalanji people. Um, so. This is a, you know, it's a small win. It's 160,000 hectares though, that um, will now be protected uh, under their care and along with Uluru and Kakadu uh, in Australia. So um, I worked to that and that's, wow. that's incredible because that means, you know, this, this wonderful rainforest will be protected and, and their culture um, can live on you know, and we're at risk of losing a lot of the culture from First Nations people. Yeah. So um, I see, you know, this this kind of agreement as some reparation, you know, making amends for things of the past and, um, you know, important going back to what we were talking about earlier in just creating a societal uh, perspective shift to, to one of guardianship and stewardship. And, uh, you know, the more we can integrate uh, these First Nation cultures back into society, um, the better. So uh, the reason I bring that up is that the, the you're right, the profits of the book will be going. Uh, there are still parts of the Daintree that are privately owned and are uh, under threat of deforestation. So half cut the organization uh led by a friend of mine actually has half a beard mm. which oh yeah that guy <laughs> i know that guy yeah uh, yeah yeah what's his name jimmy half cut uh, -huh. uh jimmy half, half cut half a beard to represent right. half the world's sounds forest. like he's in goodfellas or something yeah so half the world's forests have have been cleared and uh that's what his half beard represents Got it. yeah so i if, never understood what the symbolic nature of that was so it. it's a it's a conversation starter. Whenever uh -huh. I'm out with him, everyone of course comes up and says, "Hey, dude, what's going on?" How long has he had half a beard? Five years, I think. <laughs> yeah, a long time. He says he's going to regenerate it though. So he's <laughs> okay, he's regenerating yeah. it as we regenerate. I see. Uh, so I hope that we see a day where he has a full beard. Um, but he runs the organization Half Cut that is buying back some of the land around the Dane tree, still part of the Dane tree that isn't under world heritage, but buying it back and then uh, having it listed under world heritage 
and uh, you know, under the care of the indigenous people that are from that area. You're a beautiful man, Simon Hill. Thank Come you. Come back anytime, man. We got plenty more we could talk about. Yeah, I hope uh, I hope I haven't confused people. <laughs> no, I think it's more. good. I think <laughs> I think you cut through a lot of confusion and created clarity. Uh, from my perspective, more clarity again can be found in Simon's book. The proof is in the plants, plantproof.com. Um, on Instagram, Simon is constantly sharing super helpful information at plant underscore proof, mm-hmm. right? And you're on Twitter a little bit. You mix it up. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know, I'm, I'm, a, spats once in a I'm while. an avid uh, Twitter user. <laughs> yeah. I don't have many followers uh-huh. on there. Uh, it's that, good. That, it's a good time. Yeah. I always check in, like what, you know, like you're not afraid to scrap it up a little I bit. Thought, with, I, I uh, wondered actually, does Rich watch this? Oh uh, yeah. Oh dude, I, I I I watch from the sidelines. I don't participate. I I have that, a standard but. copy and paste line, which is, uh, can you can you provide a study that supports this claim? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I'll tell you what, then, my strike rate is not great. I I, I get barely mm, any replies to that right. one. Right. That's that's the uh, conversation ender. Yeah. There you go. There are some people who, who of course, can engage in, you know, uh, mm-hmm. a civil conversation, but. Yeah, but three or four tweets and it generally devolves into mm-hmm. less civil. Mm-hmm. But we kept it civil here today. We did. Be civil in the world and uh, enjoy the rest of your time in LA and uh, we'll do this again soon. Rich, love you, brother. Yeah, Thank you so you much too. for, for Thanks, having man. me. And, and if you find yourself in Bondi, Bondi mm-hmm. Beach, where Simon I'll hails be. from, you gotta visit Eden, Simon's restaurant. And I we can't take the about. credit. I can't take all the credit for that. I need to. Well, Tanya, Tanya, yeah, uh, my lovely partner. She, you know, she's made that the place that it is. So, uh, of course, if you're in town, come on down. Yeah, for sure. Hang Best plant based eats in all of Sydney, right there in Bondi Beach. When <laughs> when I was uh, spending time there, that was my second home. And you know, next time you're gonna have to let me pay for a meal. I didn't let me <laughs> no pay way. for a single meal. No, no, no. <laughs> we loved having you. It was our treat. Yeah, it was great. So thanks, man. Much love. Talk to you soon. Peace. Plants. <laughs>